Okay, we'll call to order the June 25th meeting of the Santa Rosa City Council. Uh, announcement or roll call, Madam City Clerk or Deputy City Clerk. Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you. Uh, Madam City Attorney, closed session report out. Uh, yes, the council uh, met in closed session this afternoon on item 2.1 and gave direction to staff. Great, thank you. No proclamations. Mr. City Manager, do we have a staff briefing? Uh, no staff briefing this evening. Okay. Uh, Mr. City Manager, do you have a report this evening? I do not have a report this evening. Madam City Attorney, what about you? I do not either. Thank you. Rolling through it. Uh, Council, any statements of abstention? Seeing it, Mr. Sawyer? Mayor, if, if there is a decision on the, um, after the interviews this afternoon, I'll be abstaining from that decision. Uh, there will not be. We have more interviews on July 16th, I believe. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, okay. Uh, Mayor, council members, reports. Anyone have any information they'd like to share? Mr. Tibbetts. I do, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a quick update on the Renewal Enterprise District. Um, I will be uh, serving as the vice chair on that body, uh, representing the city, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the other uh, thing going on is we are currently in the process of selecting an executive director to run that JPA, and hopefully there'll be an announcement over the course of the next couple of weeks. The other request I want to make here today is a, re is a request for consideration of a future agenda item. Uh, and I brought it up here before during the budget process, and that was surrounding um, contracting with a local entity to provide a homeless service attorney. Uh, in my line of work, I'm coming across a lot of people in our community who are clearly um, eligible for Social Security disability benefits who also, um, and if they had legal assistance, they would be able to actually get those benefits and go through the appeals process that sometimes uh, can prematurely uh, shut them down. Um, so I was hoping that uh, somebody would be willing to second it. We could have a discussion about it, and it's uh, not necessarily for this year's budget, but at least making sure that it, it's in that, what do we call it, the tier four consideration um, for going forward. I also think it'll really complement our efforts uh, around housing first um, nicely. May I ask a question? Yes. Through the mayor? Is this funding for another entity, for example, we might have funded legal aid for this, or is this to have someone in-house? Uh, this would, I mean, I, I prefer contracting outside of uh, the city. Um, I think legal aid would be an excellent and eligible uh, nonprofit to be able to provide that service, just like our housing services attorney. Uh, but it could be, that could be part of the discussion. I just think that we should really investigate the merits of having this position. Any other questions or someone, is there someone who'd like to second that? I'll give it a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second and then we'll get that on a future agenda for further discussion. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Tibbetts? Okay, any other council member reports? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yesterday, the uh, Measure M reauthorization ad hoc committee met for Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Uh, as this council knows, uh, that entity is exploring the options of going for reapproval in November of 2020. Uh, the initial numbers for that from the registrar's office is that it'll cost to have that item on the agenda or on the uh, ballot for folks countywide, somewhere between $559,000 and $879,000, which would mean if we do move forward and the measure lost, again, if the measure lost, the cost to Santa Rosa could be as much as almost $200,000. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on as we explore. Uh, we completed the RFP to put out there for polling uh, and uh, some uh, issue uh, work from a consultant uh, that'll be going out a little bit later this month and I'll keep everybody uh, focused on that. We also looked at uh, a summary of road pavement backlog uh, that we have uh, around Sonoma County based on getting to an 85 PCI. Uh, as you all know, we actually do 75 for this county, but 85 is the number from um, MTC. For Santa Rosa, we are looking at about a $308 million backlog, uh, which is at least not the billion dollar backlog that the County of Sonoma has as well. So I'll keep everybody posted as that moves forward, but just so you know that the RFP uh, has gone out. We'll be hearing those proposals and you'll hear a lot more about this measure in the coming months. Great, thank you. Anyone else have anything to report? 
Seeing none. Uh, item 12, approval minutes, we have none. Consent item, Mr. McGuinn. Yes. Um, item 13.1, resolution agreement between the City of Santa Rosa and Sonoma Water to continue the Creek Stewardship Program through fiscal year 2024-2025. Item 13.2, resolution appropriations uh, limit fiscal year 2019-20. Item 13.3, resolution, approved purchase order 159531, prefabricated restroom, Madden Industrial Craftsman Incorporated. Item 13.4, resolution, adoption of memorandum of understanding, unit five, police officers represented by the police, the Santa Rosa Police Officer Association effective July 1, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Item 13.5, resolution, approval of pavement restoration funding agreement within the Tubbs fire burn area. Item 13.6, resolution, contract award to CARE Evaluators Inc. to provide functional assessments to determine eligible eligibility for ADA paratransit services. Item 13.7, resolution, interagency operations agreement with Sonoma County Junior College District. Council, any questions for staff on the consent calendar? Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. Not, not a question, just a, a comment related to 13.3, related to the uh, portal loo. Just for clarification, this is not a decision on where it's gonna go. This was only a decision on the purchase. I believe that was allocated uh, before, and this is only the purchase. I know there were some questions from the public, and this is only related to the purchase. That is correct. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Seeing none, we have two cards. Item 13.3, George Uberti. Uh, yeah, I'll try to make this one as uh, quick as I can. I got a lot of cards up there with y'all. Um, I just, I feel like this is an absolute no-brainer, you know? I mean, whether or not we should have a, a public restroom, um, you know, absolutely and, uh, and unequivocally, I think we should. Um, I think that it just fulfills a very, very basic human need for people. And I just want to come up here. You all are considering it. You want input from the public. That's me. That's a lot of people in this room. And I, for one, I represent, I think, a very substantial portion. Of, uh, of the sentiment of Santa Rosa that absolutely wants you to do this, please do it. Thank Great, thank you. And George, you're also there for 13.4 on the MOU. Yeah. Uh, reset me there on that guy. For our yeah, go ahead, reset. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the MOU for the, um, for the police department. Right now, I think, uh, I think police take a lot of flack. You know, they get a lot of flack in the news, they get a lot of flack in Santa Rosa uh, for their treatment. They get a lot of flack from me, you know, uh, for their treatment of the homeless in the past. I've, I found it, you know, when, they, when they're forced to clean up encampments, um, you know, it's a human rights violation and someone's gotta violate those human rights and it ends up being uh, police officers. But I have been thinking about it because that's what you do when you're in a democracy and I don't know if it's fair for the police to take that flag. You know, they've got a job to do, right? Now, the job the police do is, uh, is catch criminals, you know? That's what they're equipped to do, right? And they get about a third of our general fund to do it. Now, if you get about a third of the general fund, then we're probably gonna expect you to do about a third of the work of, uh, of keeping our city together, right? Now, if your job is to catch criminals and a third of the available work that they're involved in running this city is not of that nature, then, we're asking you to do something that you don't have the tools to do and then getting angry with you when you fail. Now that doesn't seem like a situation that a city that is, you know, in that's what a government does. It creates a set of circumstances that are possible to succeed in and then expects that of the people that it puts in those circumstances. Now we're expecting the police to do something that they don't have the tools to do, right? That they don't have the tools to accomplish. And not only that, I'm looking at this memorandum of understanding and in article 11, it says the city reserves retains and invests with any management rights not expressly granted to the association by, the, by this agreement. Right now, these rights include A, 
the ability to determine and modify the organization of the city government and its constituent units, the uh, right to determine the nature, standard, levels, and mode of delivery of city services, right? And the right to determine the methods, means, number, and kind of personnel by which services are provided. So if we have a homeless problem and every single piece of available literature, every single study that you all personally have put together, including the 2014 A Policymaker's Guide to Ending Homelessness in Sonoma County, every single one of those studies says in absolutely unequivocal language that using law enforcement to break up home encampments is not effective and should not be done, breaks the law, breaks the, the conditions under which you are given funding to solve homelessness, and you're still asking it of these people. And you have every right, every tool, and every method at your disposal to change who you're asking to do this job, what. They have all of the funding. You can take different people. You can give this to a different job, right? You can give this to somebody with the tools to fix it, and you don't do that, right? The police don't like it, and neither do we. Thank you, George. Ian Seeley, item 13.3. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Ann Seeley, representing Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa. Item 13.3 about the so-called Portland Loo is one of the most humane things that's been on your agenda in recent months. We have been looking for some kind of relief for the homeless population, for the downtown shoppers, for the police, for, for business owners in having some place where people can use a bathroom. I do hope you support this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Those are all the cards we have for today. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, you have this item. I will move items 13.1 through 13.7 and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, your votes, please. And that passes unanimously, thank you. Not yet being five o'clock, we'll skip to item 15.1, Mr. McGlynn. 15.1, report, amendment to Measure O implementation plan for all programs to align with the fiscal year 2019-20 adopted budget. Chuck McBride, Chief Financial Officer, presenting. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the Council. Um, this is the Measure O Implementation Plan for Fiscal Year 1920. So currently, um, a little bit of the history of this, an implementation plan was created for Measure O in 2004 uh, to ally the funding for the three Measure O programs, uh, police, fire, and violence prevention. Uh, the plan shows Measure O programs with the current year budget. We also give you a forecast out through 24-25, which is the expiration of the Measure O quarter cent sales tax. Uh, any changes to the plan and implementation of this plan requires six affirmative votes by the by the City Council. Can you make that a little closer to you so we can hear a little bit there? Absolutely, Mayor. Is that better? Proposed for tonight, uh, there are no significant changes to Measure O from the from the uh, current fiscal year. Uh, most of it is going to be escalators that you're going to see in major items, uh, very similar to what you saw with the annual budget for the city. Uh, the expenditures have been updated to reflect the adopted 1920 budget and current forecast assumptions. So we'll talk about the individual departments, um, starting with fire. Uh, the fire department um, supports 10 full-time equivalent firefighters uh, under, under Measure O, uh, and they also provide some of the paramedic incentives uh, for 15 FTEs within, this, um, within the fire department. So salaries for the fire department, it's a very similar um, story to what you saw uh, in the citywide budget. Salaries up by about 17%, $307,000. 
Um, that's primarily due to uh, waiver negotiations that we conducted with the bargaining units that it had been out of um, out of contract for, for a number of years. So this is kind of a catch up and resetting that baseline is, is mostly what's driving that increase in salaries. The benefits did not go up. They stayed basically flat. And um, part of that, again, was some benefit that the city got out of the negotiations uh, and some positive movements that we saw in the um, CalPERS healthcare used by the firefighters. Services and supplies stayed relatively flat, minor increase, and that was due primarily to um, additional costs that we saw uh, in um, vehicle repair and replacement. And then that administration cost that you will see in each of those, that's the general admin overhead that we talked about during the budget process, and that's what we charge out to um, departments for general fund services. And then you see that final item there is the transfer out for debt, and that's, uh, that's debt service on Fire Station 5. Police Department again, um, primarily a, uh, a status quo budget with escalators. Uh, this budget supports um, 19 FTE officers uh, from Measure O. Salaries for the officers uh, went up marginally, went up by about 4%, so there's a modest bump in, in their salaries that, that are more in line with what we saw with the rest of the city. Um, benefits uh, went up a little bit under 3%. Um, Services and supplies are up uh, modestly by $12,000. That's again, uh, same comment as the fire department. That's primarily due to uh, costs for vehicle uh, replacement and repair. Administration fee went down a bit. Uh, and then the radio upgrade, um, that's, that was one time money that the, that the council had, um, had affirmed for the police department for the new radio upgrade that they'll be conducting. There was also some other monies uh, put into that program from other funding sources during the budget adoption. Finally, we have uh, violence prevention. Uh, this, this supports uh, nine full-time equivalent positions. Uh, salaries went up modestly, a little bit under 4%. Again, same experience that we're seeing citywide. Uh, uh, benefits went up a little bit, um, about 17%. Uh, but what we see here, benefits with a small small group like that, this is primarily people moving from, uh, from single to uh, family health plans, so there's an additional cost with that. Services and supplies uh, basically stayed um, stayed uh, level. Uh, we did have a hundred fifty thousand dollar increase in Measure O funding for the Choice Grant program. Uh, some of that is due to some uh, additional revenue bump that we saw in Measure O this year, and they're also using some of their fund balance to uh, increase uh, uh, to increase an increasing need uh, for those Choice Grants. And then the administration costs that we talked about those uh, stayed basically flat for violence prevention. So our recommendation tonight uh, is, is the Measure O Citizen Oversight Committee has reviewed and approved the Measure O implementation plan on April 25th and recommends that the, uh, that the plan be adopted. Um, I also have the subject matter experts here tonight, the uh, fire chief, the police chief, Jason Carter here, um, uh, as, as well as um, Annette Miner is sitting next to me, who's the vice chair for the committee. Uh, and I believe we have a couple of other Measure O committee members uh, that, are, that are here in the chambers. So uh, at this point, um, I will ask for questions from councils. Thank you for the presentation. Did you want to say anything about the oversight and what your conversations were like? Um, my name is Yvette Miner, and I am the vice chair of the Measure o Citizens Oversight Committee. The mission of the Oversight Committee is to ensure that all revenue received from the vote, approved transaction, and use tax are only spent on permissible uses as outlined in Ordinance 3680. Today, I'm here on the behalf of the committee to first say thank you, City Council, for your hard work to ensure that our city is safe, fun, and enjoyable place to live. Second, thank you to all the city departments that are providing the public safety services and programs funded by Measure O. Their hard work and due diligence is well appreciated. Three, thank you to the voters for passing the sales tax measure for these services. And I just want to remind everyone that the public and the Measure O sunset due date is 2025, and the services and programs that is provided by Measure O will no longer be funded. So please reinstate and keep us in mind as you're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Council, do you have any questions for any staff? Ms. Combs. Um, my first question is, uh, I notice in the report that it, it, the slides don't specifically say above or below the baseline 
for each of the department's uh, funding level. Um, I'm assuming none of them are below the baseline, but can you explain to me above or below baseline for each of the departments? Yeah, so so the baselines are, are, are delineated, I think, by the ordinance for each of the departments. So um, if you think back to um, we did the budget last week, we actually did a computation. All fire and police were well above their baselines. And what was the percentage above baseline that fire was? I do not recall, top of my head. Excuse me? I, I don't recall off the top of my head how far above it they were. Okay, so when this comes, it's good for us to see that again, I think. That's my opinion. So I'd like to have that again, um, just because that sort of keeps it in the front of my mind where we are with relation to baseline. If we're close, cutting it closer, if we've got some room to wiggle. Um, with regard to the oversight committee, if I may, uh, Ms. Meyer, thank you so much for your service and thank you for being here. Can the people who are with you, the subcommittee who are here today also like raise their hands so we can see who they are? Thank you very much for your service and for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, in the context of the report you have given us, is this only a review of the dollars or did you also do a review of the programs? We took a look at the paperwork that was sent to us by each entity and we asked questions in regards to, we had a little more in-depth conversation about the changes and departments, they did answer our questions. So we looked at a little bit of both. Okay. Did you look at or evaluate in any way the successes of the program? Did they give you data on whether programs for example, in the violence prevention program, did they give you data on yes, they did. the success? Great. Um, did, they, did you have for them any comments for improvement or comments on the programs? Mm, no, we just asked our questions in relation to the information that we had. Okay. Um, I, I will mention to you since you're here that if asked, the council could give you um, broader authority to, to provide oversight over more aspects of this program. So I'm wondering if you had any conversation about coming back to the council with regard to providing um, more oversight questions, more involvement in the direction of the programs. Did you have any conversations about that? Well, I, I know that our chair did um, ask each of us to try to get to know each department head, and which I have done. I've been meeting with each of the fire department and find out a little bit more in relation to this particular thing. And so it, the onus is on us, and it's up to us to do it. And so if you want to know more, we can get more. Okay. Um, I, I'm also wondering, uh, we have had a change of name in the last few years for the violence prevention program. Um, do you believe that the program is targeted toward the most the, uh, aspects of violence in our community? Uh, do, you, do you believe, did, has anyone presented to you that this is where the most violence is? For example, the, the pr program seems to target gang violence as opposed to say domestic violence or violence against women. Um, so I'm wondering if they discussed with you why it is targeted in the way it is, since it is a general violence prevention. And I appreciate these are not questions you got in advance. I'm, I appreciate that. Well, I will definitely say I, I do other work in the community and based on the um, gang prevention, I do know some of the work that they do in the community yes. and I would have to say yes, it does help and it does help prevent and it does direct its, its programs to the necessary public and so it does make a difference. So you feel that the gang aspect makes a difference? Yes, I do. But do you feel that the violence in our community is predominantly gang violence? No, it depends on the area that you're in in the city. So take Rosen, for example, it's still gang violence over there. And then also over, we recently had the Jacobs Park. So because of the aspects and where we are in our community, it will ha help a great deal because they provide particular programs that are in those specific areas. 
Thank you very much. Again, I want to thank you for your service. Um, it isn't easy to be on boards and commissions and to do the background work that it takes to develop the relationships. So I'm grateful for you that you are doing that for us. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually, I just wanted to quickly answer Councilmember Combs' question. Uh, I do happen to have my notes in front of me from the, the budget session uh, from, from last week. Police was 0.9 million over the baseline at 34.3% of the budget. Fire was 2.8 million over their baseline at 23.7. And then violence prevention partnership was at its baseline, making up 0.4% of the city budget. Thank you very much for, for having that information. So we're, we're well over a million dollars, over $2 million in one of the departments and nearly a million dollars over in one of the other departments. Is that what I heard you say? Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. McBride, uh, during the budget process, eliminating positions, we eliminated, I think, a half-time position in housing uh, community outreach specialist, I think that was dedicated to the former NRP, and I think that was uh, measure all funded. Question is, where was that uh, savings al allocated within the measure all budget? Yeah, and to my memory, we had eliminated the half of that position that was general fund uh, okay. funded. So I, I, I understand. So the, the elimination was general fund, not measure all yeah. fund? Yeah, and I think the measure measure of dollars are still in this budget. So if they wanted to hire that halftime position that's remaining in measure of, they could. Did you have something to add, Jason? No, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, good. Any other questions, Ms. Fleming? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm curious um, if we could state for the, the purpose of the public, and it might be Mr. Carter um, might be needed down here. I'm wondering if we can state what the purpose of Measure O is, um, is specifically as it pertains to the Violence Prevention Partnership. Uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Rogers, uh, Council Members, Jason Carter with the Office of Community Engagement. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the measure allocation is for our grant program administration and also supports our Gang Prevention Awareness Month and Parent Engagement Month. What is, um, just for clarification, what is the mission of the Violence Prevention Partnership? So we've had some evolution here. Be, when it first started in 2003, it was mainly the preventative piece, uh, or excuse me, the intervention piece. But as uh, the Portrait of Sonoma was released in the early 2000s or late 2000s, there was more of a public health approach to violence prevention. And so we adopted the Community Safety Scorecard, which has four uh, domains and 17 public health indicators. And so we still do the intervention piece. We fund street outreach programs, et cetera. But now we're all focusing on school readiness, um, student engagement, and truancy prevention as well. Great, thank you. And can you describe your work with the uh, Measure o Oversight Committee on selecting programs such as the scorecard um, and how you incorporate evidence-based uh, practice in making sure that our taxpayers are getting the most prevention and violence reduction for their, their dollar? So we, we are actually, <clears throat> we haven't involved the Citizens Oversight Committee in that process itself. Uh, from what we've been directed, they approve our budget. And so moving forward, uh, we do have, if you look in the implementation plan, we have a community safety scorecard update in fiscal year 2021. And what we'll be doing is looking at different groups like the Citizen Oversight Committee, our policy committee, operational teams, uh, our neighborhood groups, residents, to inform us on what is a true healthy community. So instead of just uh, pigeonholing it to uh, just youth and gang violence, we wanna incorporate the youth and gang violence piece, but spread that to what is a true healthy community in, in the city of Santa Rosa. 
And then additionally, and I'm not sure if this uh, question is better for you or for Mr. McBride, but it says on slide number seven, the Measure O Citizen Oversight Committee reviewed an improved Measure O implementation plan on April 25th. And I'm wondering if you could, for the benefit of the public, just quickly uh, summarize what that change is. I think um, I think the only really change that, that stuck out in this budget was the increase in the choice grants. Like I said at the beginning, everything else that we saw in that was either approved by council before, like the the um, increase for the radio infrastructure. Uh, the rest of it was was primarily just um, just the same changes that you saw within the, the citywide budget. Okay, thanks for the clarification, Ms. Combs. Thank you for the, allowing the follow up. Um, and thank you for coming down to answer specific questions. I'm sure that you are very well aware that I have a concern about one of the particular programs that is funded. Um, it is a recommendation of the American Pediatric Association that children under the age of 14 not be engaged in sparring. They can do other activities related to boxing, but that we have a boxing program. I understand that uh, in the past our monies are in some way separated, but the sparring is not, uh, has not been stopped. It's simply using other monies to fund the sparring for children under the age of 14. I have significant concerns about our involvement in a program that can lead to head injury. And I'm asking you if the Citizens Oversight Board expressed, if you asked them if they supported having children under the age of 14 engaged in a sparring boxing program. Was that, were they engaged in that conversation? No, uh, not okay. specifically, but we will be hosts, uh, facilitating our grant review team made up of multiple stakeholders. And our new cycle uh, will begin January 1st of this upcoming calendar year uh, for cycle 10. Okay, so I need to ask the city attorney if she can advise me. In the course of this vote, if I approve this item or, or move this forward, uh, does, is there implicit in this my support of the um, boxing program because I am approving the funding breakdown as it is? Um, my understanding is you will be approving the, the funding for the remainder of the, the calendar year, which would include the current um, grant programs. So I will repeat that I have significant concerns regarding the use of boxing sparring processes for anyone under the age of 14, that we have spoken with the uh, applicant who is funded for the boxing program and that while they are not directly using our money, they are continuing to engage 14 year olds and under in sparring and that I cannot approve at least part of this program's budget. I don't know if it's possible to pull it out or not so that I can have a separate yes or no vote, but I would not vote to move um, to move the budget forward as it stands because I cannot support uh, funding children under the age of 14 for head injury. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we have any cards on this item? Mr. Sawyer, you have this item. I do, thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, amending the transaction and use tax implementation plan for police, fire, and gang prevention, intervention services, and waive further reading of the text. Second. Any additional comments? Would you consider a friendly amendment to vote separately on the boxing program? No. All right, your votes, please. And that passes with six ayes, one no. Council Member Combs voting no. Thank you. Item 15.2, Mr. McGlynn. Item 15.2, report award of professional services agreement with Coastland Civil Engineering Incorporated to perform fire code plan review and inspection technical assistance services. Ian Hartage, Assistant Fire Marshal presenting.
Good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm and council members. Thank you for uh, letting us present this to you tonight. There it is. So with the increased workloads and the new, the increased uh, new development that we continue to see in the, in the city of Santa Rosa, we at the fire department have uh, had an increase in workload that we have had to find unique uh, ways to offset impacts um, to our current staffing levels, which had brought us to a similar uh, RFP for assistance that, that the building department uses and works very well. We reached out and did the same kind of thing. Um, to try to maintain our commitments to turnaround times, um, also to the, the increased large significant projects such as high rises and future um, cannabis industry with their new technologies and processes and the requirements for engineering service oversight on that. So we reached out after our long-term plans examiner retired in 2018 to try to fill a fire protection engineer within the city and we were unsuccessful in finding qualified candidates. So we underfilled that position with a plans examiner again and ha are seeking fire protection engineering services for plan review through this contract over the next five years, allocating up to $800,000 for those services. Um, those services we receive, you know, through that RFP we received five applicants and through a weighted evaluation, um, Coastland came out on top. Um, we, we gave priorities to experience and local knowledge as the higher weighted criteria that we were evaluating um, those candidates that we received. Um, so, now, so therefore, here we are today with an approved uh, contract with Coastland to do that and we're here seeking approval for allocating $800,000 over the next five years. And I'm here to answer any questions. Great, thank you and council, questions? Seeing none, do we have any cards on this item? Ms. Combs, you have this item. I am delighted to move this item. I'm sorry we don't have someone in house, but I'm thrilled that we are doing it this way if we need to. Um, and I think we need to, so thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving a professional services agreement with Coastland Civil Engineering Incorporated for fire code plan review and inspection technical assistance services and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Seeing none, your votes please. And that passes unanimously, thank you. Tony, is this two items, no comments? Wow, pretty good. Get it while you can. No, no, Mr. City Manager, 15.3. <laughs> really, you're gonna, you're gonna voice that. <laughs> Item 15.3, report, amend urgency ordinances, resilient city, RC combining district, Bill Rose, supervising planner presenting. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The item before the council this evening is an urgency ordinance, and this is related to noise, specifically related to construction impacts in the RC combining districts, the fire damaged areas. As we all know, in October of 2017, the city sustained significant damage to numerous residential and commercial structures due to wildfire. Uh, later that month, October of 2017, the council promptly acted and adopted a number of ordinances, the Resilient City Combining District. Uh, these ordinances included uh, numerous regulations, all with the intent of expediting the rapid rebuild of the fire damaged area. 
The city regulates noise in several guidance documents. Uh, chapter 17 in the municipal code limits the ambient noise levels in various zoning districts. The general plan also has guidance. It provides typical noise levels for construction. And as I mentioned, the resilient city uh, zoning ordinances also have noise regulations. And the proposal tonight is to amend those or zoning ordinances. Uh, we're going to do kind of a, a team effort here. I'm joined uh, with by Gabe Osborne from the Engineering Development Services Department, as well as Bob Aller. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Gabe. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. <clears throat> Excuse me. As Mr. Rose mentioned, um, there, I'm going to provide a little background, and there are really two documents that govern noise in general, um, and specifically as it's produced by construction activities. And we have really two sections of the city code that pertain to this. Uh, the first section is 17-16-030, and that really sets the ambient levels that occur in different zoning districts. And the ambient level is essentially the background noise. And then section 17-16-130, one two zero addresses the amount of noise that can go above and beyond the ambient level. Um, so we don't actually have a section that specifically addresses construction activity. We do have a section that addresses machinery, equipment, pumps, fans, air conditioning apparatuses. Um, those often have a tendency to run long term where construction is more of a short term noise. But the city code does state that that cannot produce a noise at a property line that exceeds five decibels over the ambient level. So the next chart was taken directly out of our zoning code. Um, as we can see, R1, R2, those are your typical residential zoning areas. That's really in the rebuild area. Um, the bulk of activity has a tendency to occur, which increases the ambient level at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then as we can see, the code section has the ambient level dropping from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then it gets quieter at that point from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. The general plan also addresses noise and it provides a little more detail about the construction activities. And it determines construction activities to be a less than significant impact, mainly based on the fact that the noise is sporadic, that construction is needed to meet a general goal, and they're often governed by conditions of approval. So typically when we have developments outside of the rebuild area, those go through some level of an entitlement process and we place conditions that control the hours in which the operation can, can occur from a construction standpoint. So these tables actually come out of the general plan and they address some of the noise production that comes from various construction activities. So as we can see here, excavation, foundation, um, erection and finishing, there's equipment that goes into that, a variety of different equipment types that can produce those noise levels. Um, so as we were seeing ambient levels that were in the 50 to 60 range in the previous chart, we can see that the construction activity actually produces noise levels that are well above and beyond that. The general plan also gets into specific equipment. Um, and as we can see, once again, we're getting in some situations all the way up to 100 decibels. Um, so we're really well above. And what this really highlights is some inconsistencies, unfortunately, in the general plan and the city code. Um, even from seven to seven under the normal working hours to do normal construction activities that are critical to the rebuild, they are exceeding, if we focus on the machinery section of the city code, the ambient levels. And they potentially could be looking at enforcement over that. So what we wanted to do is actually proof this a bit and make sure that the general plan was consistent to what we're seeing in the field. Um, so I'd like to introduce Bob Aller. Bob Aller is our quality control associate and he actually handles most of the coordination um, in the right of way side for the rebuild efforts. And he'll talk a little bit about a study we performed as part of this process. Great, thank you, Gabe. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. In March of this year, the Engineering Division conducted a construction noise survey within the RC Overlay District, sampling various construction activities. The noise level survey included the same type of construction equipment activities referenced in the city's general plan on the chart shown below. The nearly 100 noise level samples of different construction activities were collected at different times of day to produce the typical noise level table shown on page 10 of the presentation. In some samples, ambient noise levels at 5 a.m., which is pre-construction time in Coffee Park, were very near or exceeded the current city code requirements. Noise level samples were typically taken at 50 feet from the construction activity. Flip to 10. So what we're looking at right here are the results of the survey that we took. 
those results fall in line with what the general plan noise level decibels are that were mentioned in the chart uh, before. What we have is, is that equipment producing the highest noise levels were backup alarms that are associated with all types of equipment, industrial lift trucks, dump trucks, excavators, and delivery trucks. Um, some of the other larger uh, noise level equipment were construction trucks with line boom, line or boom pumps, um, which are typically used in the early morning prior to the heat setting in on the day and prior to traffic building up on 101. Um, concrete trucks cannot sit with concrete in them for a very long period of time, so most of that work is done early morning. Um, industrial lift trucks uh, produce high levels of noise, as well as generators and pneumatic equipment. In summary, the noise levels of rebuilding activities are consistent with the general plan, but higher than thresholds presented in the city code. The decibel readings taken during, during our noise study are consistent with industry standards associated with equipment used in the rebuild operations. So what we did as part of the process, and I think what we framed is that we do have the issue with basically the noise being produced for items that are really critical to the rebuild are exceeding the noise. So we basically knew we had to address this, um, but when developing a policy, we wanted to take a very comprehensive approach um, to ensure that we didn't get really too generous or too restrictive in certain areas. Uh, so we really started this process probably about October of last year um, to really engage the community and better understand some of the concerns and to really look at some of the solutions that the community would want to see as part of this process. Um, so we typically, uh, we meet with the Coffee Strong Block Captain Group on a monthly basis. We meet with the Fountain Grove uh, Block Captain Group for a period of time every other week. Um, and there was also a dedicated meeting in November 18 of 2018 um, that was held by Mr. Corsi, the mayor at the time, to discuss sound and noise specifically with the Fountain Grove area. So we really got a lot of good data out of that. And although a lot of people understood that the construction was needed to facilitate the rebuild and they wanted to see that happen, in a rapid fashion, uh, there was also some sensitivity that I want to get back to normal when I get into my home. And I want to make sure that there are, we can lessen the impacts. And they were looking at creative ways where we could potentially lessen those impacts, but not actually really pinch down on the rebuild and allow it to occur in a rapid fashion. So what we actually found as part of that community engagement is most of the noise concerns were a product of some construction activity that happened towards the end of the construction season of last year, and that's typically around September of October. Um, so at that point, there were a lot of permits that were in the system and a lot of permits that were under construction, and we had an issue with foundation pours. So typically, one needs to pour their foundation prior to the rain, and if they don't, it can be more weather dependent and they're susceptible to longer delays. So at that time, there was a bit of a pinch on concrete delivery. So concrete is one of the items that must be locally sourced. It can't be brought in from out of the area. And as Mr. Aller mentioned, they need to, uh, basically predictable delivery times. So what we were running into is people were actually taking concrete deliveries very early in the morning in some situations, 4 a.m., to avoid significant three to four week delays in the pouring of their foundation to be able to meet those windows. And the concrete pour does require a continuous running uh, pump, and it also has backup alarms. So it has a tendency to impact people in the surrounding area. So based on that, we wanted to uh, basically develop a program that allowed some flexibility in the time to account for those events that could determine to have a significant impact to the overall construction of a unit. So the program we developed was to essentially exempt the rebuild activities from enforcement under the noise ordinance, and that's mainly because we have a problem with the code section. Um, we understand that that will have to be fixed outside of the rebuild area. We'll probably use the general plan process to dive into that a bit deeper. And we want to basically overlap the exemption with specific hours of operation. So we're essentially saying construction should be commencing from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And if we determine, and it actually is the city manager or his or her designee makes the determination, that a certain event can basically cause a significant delay, and we're not talking about hours or days, we're talking about weeks, and that certain event may be allowed within those windows of basically 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. or the window of 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. So I do want to stress that it is only going to be certain activities. It won't be anything that supports the rebuild. Um, and before those activities are determined, there'll be a healthy uh, amount of outreach to the construction community, uh, the residents in the area, so they understand what those items are. 
Um, in addition, if it occurs early, because that was some of the problems from the neighboring community, a lot of what we heard is that I'd be okay with it if I was notified. So we are layering on a noticing requirement. Um, how that will look, um, we'll, we'll allow that to morph over time. It's going to have to be adaptive to different situations. Um, we typically go with 150 foot radius of occupied lots adjacent to the construction noise. Um, we have talked about sandwich boards. We have talked about door hangers. Um, we wanna basically create a self-certification process so the contractor will have to show that they performed the appropriate notification 48 hours in advance. Um, we'll expect photographic evidence of that emailed to us and that will be the date stamp. And we are proposing some level of enforcement and that typically takes the form of reinspection fees. And they're typically small, they're in the $50 range. Um, we will be, if we have repeat issues, um, we can potentially exempt contractors from performing early and they're essentially taken out of the queue. Um, we hope that that doesn't happen or we're not envisioning that. Um, what we're finding is that the rebuild processes are really drilled down, we're getting more coordination and not as many things are happening in that. Um, so the purpose of this, just to stress again, is to correct the issues in the code so we're not enforcing, but also be nimble enough to that if we experience problems towards the end of this year when people are on the two year mark from an insurance issue to rebuild, we wanna make sure we have flexibility flexibility to give a little more time to do that. So at this point, I will hand the presentation back over to Mr. Rose. He will talk about the CEQA exemptions and bring it to a closure. Thank you, Gabe. So as a discretionary action, this project is subject to the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Uh, CEQA provides for several exemptions. They're all related to uh, working on projects that are a result of a disaster or a declared emergency. And so these are indicated on this slide. With regard to the benefits, uh, the proposal will allow additional flexibility in the rebuild of the fire damaged homes. It is also intended to allow for a quicker rebuild. So the idea being that whereas you will have some additional noise on a day-to-day -day basis, the overall construction time will be decreased because you can get essentially more hours in the day. Uh, and then lastly, it will alleviate staff time dedicated to noise complaints. So in conclusion, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the Council amend Section 20-28.100, Resilient City Combining District, to exempt construction activities associated with the rebuilding efforts from adherence to the City's noise ordinance as described in Chapter 17-16 of the City Code and establish specific construction hours that may be modified by the City Manager when needed to support a timely rebuilding process for those parts of the City of Santa Rosa most severely impacted by the Tubbs and Nuns fire, fires of October 2017. That concludes the staff presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you for that presentation. I just wanna um, start out by complimenting specifically Bob and Gabe, having attended many of those uh, community conversations about this topic, you know, clearly it's not a um, black and white issue, but the way you've engaged with members, specifically most of my um, involvement has been through the Coffee Park, but actually talking, listening, brainstorming, it's not telling, I really appreciate your methodology and that fact that you're there and you've been there from the beginning, so thank you so much. Uh, questions from Council, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if you could go back to slide 13 just for a second. I wanna make sure I'm translating here and, and understanding correctly. Uh, no one will be, able, will be permitted to do construction activities between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m., period. And if they choose to do it, if they're approved to do it between 5 a.m. and 7 or 7 p.m. and 9, they have to do the 48-hour noticing. Is that correct? That is correct, and just to differentiate between exterior construction activities and interior, because what's important to note is that the sound is produced typically by exterior construction activities. So when a home is closed in and someone is basically laying tile inside and it doesn't impact a neighbor, that's really exempted out of this. Um, so typically roofing, framing, things of that nature, but you're absolutely correct, that is, the, that is the requirement of notification in those windows and we're not allowing it from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. I appreciate that. And then the uh, enforceability you talked a little bit about, you mentioned the fee. Is that fee on the reoccupant of the home? You said it's about $50? It is, yes, and it typically applies to the contractor. So what we deal with in, in right-of-way violations in general, um, we do have a fine enforcement as part of that. Um, and then typically our, our next level of progressive enforcement would be stop work. 
uh, because the action was already done. Um, so what we're hoping is, yes, the fee gets attention. We don't want it high enough that that fee is then transferred over to the property owner. Um, and we're very transparent with the property owners about the fact that there is a fine in this particular situation. And once again, that was a desire on their end. So the contractor has to pay that. And then, as I mentioned before, the bill, we would have the ability to essentially say on a site by site, you're really not eligible to perform that work because you're not coordinating with the neighboring um, property owner as well. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. That was going to be my next question was whether or not that fee was potentially passed through to the person who's trying to reconstruct their home. Uh, I appreciate the clarification that it actually would end up on, uh, hopefully end up on the contractor who created the offense. Thank you. Other questions, Council? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Gabe, quick question. I, you know, in reading the ordinance, I didn't see a, an expiration date on this. Does that, am I to assume that this expires with the expiration of the RC combining district? If I recall, that has an expiration date or we renew it. And when is that? That is correct. So basically what we're trying to do is anything associated with the rebuild, we're trying to attach that to the RC overlay. Mm -hmm. um, the the need for that to extend likely will exist. We'll track that as it goes along um, with the development of activity and what we need to extend at some point. Um, likely at that point you get into a discussion about what should stay and what can come off. Mm -hmm. um, something like this will likely stay as long as the construction activity stays. That's our general desire to see that actually be applied to the last home that's built if needed. Um, we get to a point where where the impact doesn't necessarily exist in the same way because of the volume drops. Yeah. So that will be analyzed as we move along. But do, do you know off the top of your head, and it's okay if you don't, but when is the that expiration or renewal, I should say, uh, is expected to come forward? Not sure, that's all right. The reason why I bring it up is because it's my understanding, and I could be wrong, but a lot of the times foundation laying is really big in the kind of the summer dry months. It's not a big wet month thing. Um, and what I'm kind of, reading into this is that we're, we're really trying to accommodate um, concrete, yes, other things as well. But um, the reason why I ask about expiration is, um, you know, I, thinking out loud, it may make sense to look at some of these regulations going into the school year when it's also rainy, people are uh, maybe a little bit more uh, uptight because work, school, et, et cetera, and we're not laying concrete anyways. I might be interested in seeing that. I'm not saying that we need to do that just yet. I just air it out here for my colleagues to hear and for you as well. I think, you know, in, in the, what it really boils down to here is that, uh, you know, one person's inconvenience should not extend the timeline of somebody else's crisis. And I think it gets all too often easy to forget that people rebuilding are still going through their own crisis in some fashion. Um, but I will want us to, to track this um, significantly because I think it is going to have a very um, strong negative impact on residents who have moved back in or who are in homes there currently. And Mr. Mayor, do you have that time? It's uh, 2020, October 9th, 2020. Great, thank you. Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm wondering if you can clarify the uh, the designee or the city manager. I'm, I'm imagining that if somebody is experiencing a, a noise violation at 4.30 in the morning that, Sean McGlynn, you don't want us to call you. So <laughs> I was hoping that you could elaborate on that because a lot of people really are. Oh, you do want them to call you? Um, there, there will be some clarity around who the number to call is, but again, it will have a complaint system. The complaint system works as it normally is. That's, that's an enforcement capability, and we get those, to, Bob and his team get that out right away. So Mr. Aller will be coordinating the complaints. The, the request that will coming from me, to me or my designee, will be about the opportunity to extend and what are the circumstances creating the potential window to extend. So the extend will happen through the city manager or designee. The complaint process will happen through Bob and his team. Okay, thank you. So we won't be complaining directly to you, but it will be made clear. And about they are how... welcome to complain directly to the city manager, though. Well, well I do regularly, but I, I meant about this. So, um, but <laughs> we'll, we'll make it clear. Um, and also, I'm wondering if, uh, in, in your estimation, uh, a warning first and then a $50 fine is going to be significant enough, because what we're not hoping for, we don't really want $50. What we really want is like a parking ticket. We really want our contractors not to, to do it. So I'm wondering if, you, if you, in your, it's your belief that this will be a deterrent. 
Well, I think what we'll have to see is that, like anything else in the rebuild, we'll have to try and be nimble enough to correct. Um, what we've seen on other fronts is the fine does correct. So we typically enforce right-of-way, lumber in the right-of-way, material storage in the right-of-way, and the fine, as they add up, has a tendency $50 can turn into $3 to get some attention. Um, what we've seen is the problem is not nearly as bad as it was last year. So the industry as itself has kind of corrected a little bit. Um, there's more courtesy. Uh, the reason we're pushing this forward now is we're really going to have more occupancies than we've had thus far. So we're going to have more people that are a bit more concerned about noise. Um, what we're willing to do is try it. If it doesn't, we'll correct. And we'll figure out a way to then elevate that enforcement from a progressive standpoint that then ends up in the result. Because you're absolutely correct. We don't want to charge a fine. We just actually want to ensure that that courtesy exists and that people are properly notified. Great. Thank you. Ms. Collins. I'm... I appreciate the work you've done on this and the outreach that you've done. Um, I am surprised we are doing it in this way. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to sort of explore where you explored and how we ended up at this proposal. Um, is, since we are looking at specific or certain events, for example, placing concrete, why would we not do this on a case-by-case -case basis and have there be, for example, a waiver process that we authorize the, uh, the department to approve with notice rather than do an ordinance where we change the policy to 5 a.m. in this sort of wholesale manner. Well, so one of the challenges is from an enforcement standpoint, how the city code is worded right now is that we can enforce from the construction noises that we're seeing in the middle of the day because they are exceeding the ambient levels. And that's not a situation we want to put the contractors in because that is needed. So we needed to take that piece out of it. And that was really highlighted by the community because we were saying from a noise ordinance standpoint, they'd have to adhere to it. So it's really correcting that enforcement issue. So that's essentially- That's one piece. That's one okay. piece. Yeah, so the other piece that we were really trying to tackle is exactly that. How do you kind of put a variance process in place um, for the issues that are really presented today that we know are going to be an issue tomorrow? And that's really what we do in, in, from a community outreach standpoint. I think I failed to mention that we actually deal, deal with the builders exchange and the contractors on a monthly basis. So what we're trying to gauge is not don't let me know it's an issue tomorrow. Let's see if we can game plan it out and figure out what's going to be an issue in the future. Um, so the variance process really is essentially what we're attempting to give to the city manager, his or her designee, to essentially say, not really on a case by case, but does this activity constitute something that would need to happen early to not delay the overall rebuild? Um, because typically what we're seeing is it isn't really a case by case. It's a, it's a problem with concrete and affects everyone. It doesn't just doesn't affect one lot. And we didn't necessarily want to create that for someone that just got behind, um, because that's part of it too. We wanted it to be a real issue that we knew existed and we wanted to create a mechanism for it, because many people are very sensitive about that time frame. Can, can we be clear that this is about concrete only? So basically our, our plan moving forward is to basically give uh, the ability to make the determination and then once that determination is made, it's going to be based on a variety of different outreach channels. So we need to understand there's an issue. We're going to deal with the community regarding that. We're going to deal with the builder community regarding that. So there has to be a determination that's made and then once there is, there has to be a way to outreach that. So people need to clearly know that it's only about concrete pours. Um, so they need to understand that up front. So in most of the community engagement, because that is a very good question and that did come up. So how do we know that that activity is approved to do it? Um, so we are continually meeting with the neighborhood groups. We're going to continually have those discussions. We're going to use our normal outreach channel so they're well aware of that decision prior to running in a situation where they're questioning that that individual can do it next to them. But we are looking for some flexibility because things are discoverable as we go through this journey together. And then we're, you know, we're struggling sometimes to find time and bandwidth to get this in front of the council to remedy a situation that needs remedied really quickly. So we are asking some flexibility so it's not just concrete pours. It's as we're able to identify a particular sorts of circumstance that have 
uh, a, a trend associated with them and be nimble enough to address those issues in the field instead of uh, we are, are, are posting requirements, getting them in front of council, getting the staff report together. It allows us some flexibility to address those issues as they arise. Kim, I guess this is a city attorney rel relative question. Can we differentiate between homeowner rebuilds and speculative housing or new construction in this area? So could we word this in such a way that we are facilitating rebuilds, but that it does not apply to new construction in the areas? From is a, it legal to do right, that? Right. From a legal perspective, you know, is there a rational basis to cons to distinguish between uh, owner builder and a, um, a a developer that does not have a buyer in in, in hand? Um, I, I, I'm not. I, I think that's a little bit difficult to make that distinction. Well, uh, it's, it may be possible. Um, uh, the question I would ask difficult. would be that an owner builder is going to have to live with their neighbors. But a speculative housing builder doesn't have to live in the neighborhood, so that to me is a significant distinction when you're when you're doing something that affects your neighbors. Right, and and uh, also depending on I don't know the percentages of construction between owner builders and and when I use the term owner builder, I I understand that that's a different term when you're actually getting a permit versus yes. I'm using it more generically that if if the um, if the owner has either building himself or has hired the, the contractor. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the percentages are, so I don't know what the difference would be in terms of the impact um, uh, overall. We, we would need to, if that would be the council's request, we would need to table the item and come back with a more full report on, on, on that particular option. We, we, I, I, that's not been the task at hand. The task at hand had been approaching rebuild. We haven't had that conversation, but if council so wished us to go back and follow up and, and look at that particular item, we're happy to do so. Can you also clarify for me, does this apply only to single family residences? Actually, what we're targeting is any redevelopment within the RC area. So okay. there are multifamily so units in that there That continues, well. that also concerns me. Um, I'm having, yeah. If I can just add maybe a little additional information, I think Gabe mentioned this, but when we do discretionary projects like subdivisions, and remember we're basically rebuilding subdivisions one lot at a time, or with some builders, multiple lots, but essentially it's one at a time. When we do those larger scale subdivisions, we can control these conditions because yes. we have discretion. We don't have that in this case. These are ministerial permits. so. This is not an unusual activity to condition projects like this. It's just that in these instances, unless we have discretion, we have no mechanism to do it. I am eager to give you discretion to do this. I am not eager to give you discretion to do this wholesale throughout the area for anybody who wants to build anything there. Um, it concerns me to not prioritize homeowners rebuilds. Uh, and I would really like to see that be an element of this. Again, if, if, if council wants us to take this back, we're, we, can, we can look at that particular issue and amend what and bring it forward. What kind of delay do you think that would I, I can't, we, okay. we, I mean, we're, we're looking at a different set of data and we'd have to analyze that data and, okay. and get, understand that. So I'm hearing that we want to talk about enforcement. Um, my personal, sitting here, my personal experience with our noise enforcement is that it is not very effective. And so I'm trying to sort out um, how we ensure that we more effectively enforce the noise ordinance than we did, for example, with Bodine, where noise ordinance violations continued and continued and continued, but we, we said they had violations, they said they had violations, work did not ever stop. So uh, it really concerns me that we're loosening a noise ordinance that we don't seem to me to enforce very effectively. Can you address for me how we, uh, wh why you think that this would be different, that 
somebody wouldn't just order concrete when they wanted it and let it happen. And $50 doesn't seem to me to be a particular deterrent. It, it feels, it feels, I mean, I don't know, you know, houses cost an awful lot. We have people come in here and argue about $1,000, but we don't ever have anybody come in here and argue about 50. So to address the concern, concerns about the noise enforcement, it is challenging. Um, and essentially, uh, from a decibel standpoint, you have to have a decibel meter and you have to make a determination that it is exceeding the ambient noise. Um, so as part of this process, we researched what a lot of jurisdictions do on the construction side. Um, and it's fairly typical in a noise ordinance to exempt construction and then overlap it with hours of operation. Hours of operation are much easier to inspect. So if we're saying that you can't perform construction activities, we can conduct inspections and we can witness that. Um, it gets out of the argument over the level of sound being performed by the construction activity. Um, so we do think that that will be easier to enforce. Um, and once again, I will reinforce, we have not seen the concrete pours outside of the pinch that occurred last year occur early on. Um, so we're not hearing those same concerns from the community. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the development community, like everyone else, had to get a program that they could get running, and they have. Um, and it is able to work into the normal working hours. So once again, we just want to be nimble enough that this comes up and we can handle it in the pre in basic basically a comprehensive fashion, um, we want a solution that lets us react to that for whatever reason. Um, and it could very well be that it becomes framing, and it becomes framing in the heat. So that's the reason for allowing people to go a little later. Um, so those are some of the components that we've, we've thought about in the future that might be a problem, and we just want to make sure that there's a solution in place to address them. I'm having more trouble with the 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. time than I am with the time to 9 p.m. Um, that may be a reflection of my own hours. <laughs> uh, I, I have one other question, and I, I'm trying to locate where it is on my sheet because I knew I had it. Um, and it was a question for the city attorney. I'm going to have to go. Oh, um, do you believe that uh, the resolution, as stated, is clear about the linkage so that there is a timeout that it has to be extended past. Um, I'm concerned that the expiration is very unclear. The, I, I thought that the ordinance that we're attaching to goes for five years. So I'm trying to figure out. In terms of the expiration of the entire RC zoning. I, I, that this is in fact tied to the entire RC in a way that this expires when the RC expires. Yes. You're comfortable with that? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I hope I will listen to comment. Uh, I have a lot of questions about for, for I'm very curious to hear what the public has to say. Uh, I know that we meet with builders and that you hear from builders regularly. I hear from people who are upset about noise regularly. Um, so we, we don't all hear from the same same groups. Um, I am very interested in how we differentiate between homeowner rebuilds and speculative housing on this one. So I will be interested in hearing that from the public and also from my colleagues. Council, any additional questions for staff? Okay, we have a couple cards here. First card, George Uberti, followed by Reginald Piambo. So I just want to say I think I probably could have built a house in the time it took you all to discuss that. Uh, we declared a municipal emergency in 2016 regarding homelessness. 2016. I don't know what the word emergency means to you, but to everyone who's in a state of emergency, it means that the priorities regarding that emergency go to the top of their list immediately. Now, municipal declarations allow you to go circumvent municipal codes, right? Now, that emergency has been in effect without interruption since it was declared, meaning everything that those guys just said was pointless and unnecessary. There was absolutely no reason to go through any of that. You already empowered yourself to circumvent these codes, all right? Homelessness and homes are the same problem, right? You're all big, big kids. You know that, all right? You know that all of that was unnecessary. There's absolutely no reason 
for you to add another four weeks to the construction of homes because some person doesn't like it's too bad. You're, this is an emergency situation that we are in, all right? People's houses burnt down, all right? And we were in a state of emergency before that ever happened. There's absolutely no excuse for that entire study to have even happened. All right, now you want community input, you can get it. All right, people are gonna come up here and they're gonna tell you about what they want if they're unhappy. You, you don't know there's an emergency, I don't believe you, right? You're bad at playing dumb, you're bad at it. Why continue to fail at being stupid? It's a dumb problem to have, right? It's an unnecessary one. Right? It, 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 you, th there was absolutely no reason for any of that. All right? Now, emergencies are things you take seriously. Take your job seriously and do it. All right? Build homes. Okay? 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Really? Really? I mean, I'm not the one who needs the break. All right, the people with nowhere to live are. The people in a state of emergency need that emergency to be over. You're comfortable declaring it, but you're not comfortable doing anything about it. I mean, you're comfortable sitting there and listening to these guys talk about something that didn't need to happen. I don't know why, all right? Do your job. That was ridiculous and it was pointless. Absolutely no reason for it to happen, it's a crime. Stop it, all right, grow up. Thank you, George. Uh, Reginald Piombo, followed by John Allen. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, my name is Reginald D. Piombo, Esquire, at your service. I've made a fool of myself lately. I do stupid things because I'm a real autistic idiot, so on. But I know this town. If you want to lift the microphone up, we can barely hear you, sir. I know what this town really needs, and that's love. Love for what goes on around here. We can raise this up for you. I have a few ideas that I haven't worried about trying to pen. One is maglevity. I'm gonna make that train fly. I figured out a way to electricity how to send pulses of electricity Mr. Tesla invented. And wind power to be used in the freeways. I'd like to see solar energy started throughout the whole city real soon. There's no reason why we can't have the money funded from the government to do solar installation. We need industry to make them panels around here. Opti Cody used to be right over in North Park, towns away. Uh, solar panels are not hard to make. Just like downtown in the park, the little panels up on top of all the flagpoles can be converted to public use. To run all the energy. I have manpower and the brain to do just everything as I please. Believe that. And as far as trying to take over anybody's job, these people are fine at what you propose so far. But I'm going to take a total look at the expenditure, the budget, and everything else that's designed the city needs. And where we're going to send the money to for who needs the most help. Because we help ourselves. I'm a, I live on the street. I'm happy to be outside. I love it. It's during the summertime now. It's so beautiful to see God's work. To just clear your mind in the morning and meditate and say, what do we really need for this town today? is love, honor, and respect, and I try to give my utmost of it. Like I said, I've been a little stupid. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Allen, followed by Ron Fiore. I'm on 
Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and distinguished members of council. My name is John Allen, Chief Operations Officer of APM Homes and a Santa Rosa resident. Today before you is a revision to our current noise ordinance. I urge you to pass and adopt the proposed noise ordinance as it relates to the fire rebuilds. In the past year and a half since the 2017 Tubbs fire, our communities both in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County have recovered exceptionally well. With the two year anniversary coming up this October, it is imperative that we do all that we can to support fire survivors in the construction industry. We need to get these homes completed and people back in their homes. While it may be an inconvenience for some, it is an inconvenience to our entire community not to have our community members back in their homes and moving on to that last phase of recovery, which is rebuilding their lives. With an anticipated hot summer, the temperatures will cause issues with concrete needing to be poured early in the mornings and evenings when temperatures are cool. With high heat stress affecting workers, midday shutdowns may require the industry to start early and return in the afternoon when temperatures are acceptable for work. With the rebuild being an urgency matter, I insist that extended work hours be an urgency as well. I have personally met with the building community and the fire survivors. Uh, I know that staff has done the same. They've met with both building industry and fire survivors to get input on this. And I believe that a mass consensus is that we want our homes uh, built back. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Ron Fiore, followed by Bob Hansen. Uh, hello, um, I wasn't really expecting to speak, but um, I'm a homeowner up in Fountain Grove, and uh, I've been you know, living up there throughout this entire time, um, so I'd like to give a little bit of input. Um, I'm not really opposed to an extended time or for it, um, just to give a little input about you know, my experience. Um, I haven't really complained about people up there doing stuff, um, and it seems like that um, nobody really even follows the hourly time that's supposed to be put up there in the first place. So I haven't seen you know a lot of complaints, at least that I know about, or people following the rules. Um, and then the one thing I wanted to say about the concrete, it seems like the concrete is not even an issue. Um, it's not really a super loud process and only takes most of the time a day or two. So I think it's more of um, other things that I would like to not see is like nail guns, roofing hammers and stuff like that. You know, with the early hours, I'm not too concerned about late times. I'm just like um, Julie was talking about. Um, mainly just like I think the most inconvenience is like heavy hammering or heavy equipment or banging on the ground or um, wood chippers, which nobody's talked about. Um, wood chippers going even on Sundays in late hours all the time. So, um, and then the other thing is the uh, um, 150 foot notice. You know, like um, in Fountain Grove, 150 feet is nothing you could hear 2,000 feet away. So um, I don't know if something could be done maybe a little further about that. So um, that's all. So anyways, I am looking forward to, you know, moving along with the process too. So um, just some input. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Bob Hansen, followed by Thomas Ells. Good afternoon. It's my understanding the work day is sunrise to sunset. Anything other than that is an infringement on my rights to feed my family. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thomas Ells. Hi, thank you. I, I just thought I would address a little bit about the distinctions between contracting. Essentially, there's different parts. One, one part is owner builder who takes capital gains uh, deduction when they occupy for two years or less, and they pretty much know who that, they they know they're going to do that. And there's contractors who build eight or more homes a year, and there's contractors who build eight or less homes a year. So there's kind of like three areas right there. You can kind of find some differentiation there if, if you wanted. Um, uh, but mostly, I wanted to step up because these, these things pass by so quickly. Um, 
So Sydney, Australia is in a climate emergency. Um, they had fruit on their trees that caught on fire and burned. That's weird. Actual fruit on the trees caught on fire and burned. So we have funds that we're going to make available. Not really for fire stuff yet. Um, Highway 37, $3 billion, $880 million for the three and a half miles between 101 and, and um, that bridge that's over by, uh, over by the river, over by the um, Sonoma, or uh, Petal Petaluma River, or Sonoma River, Petaluma River, I think. Thank you. Um, $880 million, it's $378 a square foot, approximately. Approximately, for the $880 million, for that, three and a half miles. Um, and we're developing a fire fund, the, the governor, of $21 billion. And I'm not sure what that's gonna do. Is that just gonna sit there? Because it doesn't sit there, it gets invested. It's, they don't, funds don't just lay around in a vault like gold. They're invested somewhere. Uh, and those could be directed both for the prevention of the PG&E caused fires, which some of them, I'm not saying all of them, some of them were, and, and it, would, it would behoove them to utilize those in ways to provide infrastructure that prevents or limits the damages caused by the fire in the, in the results. So maybe it could be borrowed from that fund or, you know, at, at a very accommodating rate or something. But there are, there are a lot of funds available. And we should direct those things to, those funds to the kinds of things that can help us both prevent and recover uh, from the next fire. Thank you. Thank you. Are those all the cards we have on this item? Okay, why don't we uh, bring it back to the council, uh, Council Member Fleming, if you wanna make a motion, then we'll have additional discussion after we get a motion on the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I move an urgency ordinance of the city of the count of the council of the city of Santa Rosa amending title 20 of the Santa Rosa city code amending section 2028.100 resilient city RC combining district to exempt construction activities associated with the rebuilding efforts from adherence to the city's noise ordinance as described in chapter 17-16 of the city code and establish the city excuse me um, city code and establish specific construction hours that may be modified by the city manager when needed to support a timely rebuilding process for those parts of the city of Santa Rosa most severely impacted by the Tubbs and Nuns fire of 20, October 2017 and wait for the reading of the text. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And can I get clarification from the city, Madam City Attorney, because this is an urgency ordinance, am I correct that we're gonna need five votes to pass this? Yes, it does require five affirmative votes. Okay, um, now that we have a motion, uh, open up for any comments. Ms. Combs. Thank you, I, I have a couple of comments. First, I, I have absolutely no problem with uh, uh, voting in favor of the uh, exempting construction from certain parts of the noise ordinance because it's clearly necessary. We're setting people up to be in violation and we absolutely need to change that. And it's probably been needed to be changed in other regions of the city as well. Um, is it possible for us uh, to pass it now and come back and revisit the, um, the penalty after we've seen how that goes? As, as staff said, that's uh, absolutely what we do. We go through a okay. process, figure out if we need to make adjustments um, and th that, but we like to take an approach that we, the team has worked on and been successful with in the past and in, in ensuring uh, positive behavior in the, in the field. Can the city, the city attorney, can the city manager differentiate or make distinctions about the hours based on the applicant, or does he have to do a generalized change of the hours based on this ordinance? 
Based on this ordinance, he would not be permitted to distinguish based on the character of the applicant. Uh, he would look at the circumstances um, of the request, but not the not who the applicant is. Can, if the applicant was a repeat offender, can the city manager use that as a reason? Um, based on the way the ordinance is written now? Not as, not based on the way the ordinance is written now. Okay. Uh, I want to approve this. I want this to go forward. I think we probably do need this. Can it come back to us with language corrections, allowing the city manager to have some judgment about repeat offenders and about the um, differentiation about the, the applicant who is rebuilding their own home versus someone who is doing uh, speculative construction? Because a speculator doesn't necessarily need the same time or urgency that someone who is out of their house now. If that's a follow-up direction, I'm happy to entertain that direction. Okay. Um, would you uh, accept that as a friendly amendment that uh, even, even as we move this forward that we request staff to come back um, with specific language to uh, amend this at some point in the future? I'm willing to be vague and open about when that point in the future is, but as a friendly amendment to bring it back so that the city manager has discretion with regard to repeat offense and with regard to prioritizing this kind of waiver for individuals who are rebuilding their a home that, th that they want to occupy. I appreciate the intention of this, uh, the, the vague, the vague nature of it, and also um, I think it, it's fairly complicated, so I'm, I'm going to not accept the friendly amendment, although I appreciate the intention. And when I spoke with staff about this issue earlier in the day, they were pretty clear that they have a, a wide range of discretion for taking repeat offenders out of the rotation. They, they haven't said as much here, but I, I feel fairly confident that uh, if it does come up again, I, I would support you um, in in, um, and I would give you a second in getting this agendized and, and addressed. If I may ask, um, I'm hearing staff answer the same question two different ways. Uh, does the city manager or do we as a city in some other mechanism have a way to manage uh, repeat offenders? I would say yes, that there are ways to address repeat offenders, um, but it is not through this particular provision. Mm. So essentially, and it's really in the vein of we want to try it, we're not seeing the same level of repeat offenders. Um, so it's really in the vein of a progressive enforcement action, which we have in a lot of different arenas. Um, so essentially, you'll go from a warning to a fine, and then there's a stiffer penalty that goes along with that. And as I mentioned previously, that typically can go to a stop work, um, which we have the ability because people are not being consistent with the codes and requirements in place. Um, that's more of a stringent decision, um, and it has more of an impact, and then there's usually a corrective measure. So that's usually enforcement to get something fixed where this is a penalty for behavior that occurred in the past. So what we'll look at as part of this, and I think we can commit to basically addressing it and figuring out what's not working, engaging with the community on what potentially isn't working, getting the consensus again, and coming back. And, and that's really been the pattern. Um, a lot of these, we do have to get a program on the ground. Um, we are a little concerned about the level of activity that's occurring, and we want to make sure we stay ahead of that. Um, but I think we, we can put forward that commitment commitment to say if there's problems with that and we are seeing repeat offenders and we're running into challenges, we'll bring forward a modification that can focus on that particular piece. Thank you very much. And I want to repeat that I am not looking at not moving forward today. I'm looking at how do we modify for improvement in the future. Thank you. Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm prepared to, to move this forward today as presented. You know, we rely on you a lot to bring us information. It seems to me that you've done a, a really good job of getting due diligence and community input. Um, I, I am going to make a request, though, and the, the mover can choose to keep it or not keep it, of course, but just that we get an update on either the August 27th or September 3rd meeting as part of the fire recovery and rebuild update. Just what's going on with um, this construction, you know, answering some of the questions that uh, Councilwoman Combs had and, and I think that we all have, which is how is this impacting 
uh, some of the folks who, who currently live there are we seeing repeat offenders, and then we can make those necessary adjustments. Gabe, that I appreciate you said, which is we're government, sometimes it's best to go in, try things that we think are gonna work, and be willing to say, we got it wrong, here's how we can tweak it to make it better. So so can, can we just amend that we'll provide a quarter report during our-, our That's if, fine. So uh, having heard from two of my colleagues, I move, uh, accept, uh, move as is with the, um, Accept, accepting a friendly amendment um, that would include a, a quarterly report on the status of this uh, adjustment. Thank you. Mr. Rogers, you good with that also? Okay. Any additional questions? Yeah, question, comments. So do you have one? Actually, how about if I come back to you, since this is your initial motion, you'll have the final word on this one. Uh, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor, and, and this may fall into the concept of revisiting in the, in the next quarter, but it's, it speaks, my, my question speaks to the comments made by the, the neighbor um, and the notification. Uh, it's possible because of the nature of the way sound travels, usually up, um, that even if we were to expand the, the communication level um, greatly, that it would not necessarily um, uh, change the, uh, the the response in the community. But I, I have to believe that the more people that know that something's going on, that it's going to be limited, that there would be fewer complaints. Is that something that we could also revisit in a few months well, as far I, as how I think, far I think, out we go? I think just as what, we're, what was being cited was what we do in Coffee Park, I think what also was cited is that we're looking at each circumstance and analyzing the circumstance. So please don't, although we cited 150, the team is actually looking at these circumstances and making a determination, working with everybody to say, this is the appropriate way. And, if we, and, it, and again, they're also being extremely responsive if they're finding that there is a deficiency, they're going out to address that. So don't, there's not, what's not, what I don't want to leave the room with is that there's like this set prescriptive way that we're doing notification. As the team said, we're looking at circumstances and figuring that out. Um, there, there's a variety of ways. As, as they said, it's, it's not just sending notification to people's houses, it's setting out sandwich boards so that as neighbors drive by, they get, we're, 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 there's a full array, council member, of, of I communication. Thank you. And I would also note that the ordinance itself provides that the radius may be adjusted by the city manager or his designee. Thank you. Any other additional comments? Um, just m my f final comments that we're, I'm very comfortable with because you have been very responsive. Um, in, I'm sure even just hearing the comments from the gentleman living in Fountain Grove, because I know, Bob, you, you write that stuff down. And the other thing is when we have the um, the standing homes, meaning in Coffee Park, so that's the, the target audience, those that are, are in there. And as you had mentioned, um, that population is going to be growing. You've been very responsive in, uh, to what their concerns and issues are, so I really do appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to add that uh, you know we we've issued hundreds of correction notices within the rebuild areas um, over the last uh, you know 16, 18 months. If not, uh, when we get into stormwater compliance, literally we've issued thousands of correction notices for different types of right of way violations, environmental violations. We work with the building industry on a routine basis to more or less dial in the construction activities so that they are in compliance with what we need them to be in compliance with. And, and I really gotta say that the building industry has cooperated and, and responded to our correction notices and our outreach with them to help build best management practices for reconstructing homes in the fire rebuild area. So um, I really don't see this as, as being any different than any of the other correction work that we have been performing over the last 18 months. Um, we will dial it in and we will work with the builders to, to get this uh, noise in control. Great, thank you. Ms. Fleming, final comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to say that um, I was really appreciative of all the outreach work that your team did um, and also appreciative of your time walking through the flexibility and the uh, tent that you'll be keeping a really clear and um, 
consistent pulse on how things are going and making sure that we wrap the community back in not just think, keep things to 150 foot radius where noise is gonna travel. I, I really felt reassured that, that the specifics of this plan will take into account community feedback and on the ground experiences. And I wanted to give a, a special thank you to you, Bob Aller, uh, for your coming up with the idea of the construction industry doing their own time stamping and taking a picture and emailing it in. I thought that was a great way to put the onus of responsibility on the construction and take it away from the city having to be proactive and divert resources that way. It also allows our builders to uh, have some of their own uh, skin in the game in terms of going through this process and not feeling like they're held up by our city staffing resources. So again, thank you so much for that creative approach. Thank you, Council Member Fleming. Um, it really is, it's, it's, a, it's a cooperative effort um, between the, the homeowners, um, the builders, and the city, and the collaboration is paramount. Um, in order to get this work done um, in the best interest of all the parties involved. Thank you. Thanks again to you and your team. Great, with that, we have a motion to second your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, we will go back to public comment on non-agenda matters. I have one card, George Uberti. All right, try to be quick on this. Uh, I feel like I've given it to you pretty hard uh, today, uh, you know? I mean, uh, I lay it on you about uh, as hard as I can because I don't, I don't think you do your jobs very well. Um, but you know, one thing that you might know about me is that I am not all talk as much as I do talk about it. Uh, I was running for office until today when I realized that, you know, due to a moving thing, I, uh, I am outside my former district. But as an extension of my run for office, which I, I am not finished with, um, I would like to extend to Ms. Fleming, who has conveniently left, um, and really to anyone on this council, an invitation to debate. Uh, at the downtown Santa Rosa Library. Now, you know, I talk a lot and I feel like you all do your best to act like it doesn't happen, right? Um, but I'm not the elephant in the room, right? The elephant in the room is how you are criminal. You're not just doing a bad job, right? You're doing an illegal job. Right? Ordering the police to clear out homeless encamp encampments and lying about it to the public, right? Uh, failing to get uh, uh, meaningful financial audits of the public funds that you are charged with administering, right? Uh, these are things that I can't just keep come up, coming up here and informing these people that are happening and then, you know, have you go on like you've had a stroke or something and just act like it didn't happen, all right? These are things that you need to answer for. All right, um, now I'm working on a case right now that I plan on putting in federal court uh, against the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors and the Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector for the illegally, uh, the illegal failures of administration in government funds, right? Specifically as they relate to the government auditing standards. All right, now if you have things you wanna say about it, if you feel like you're innocent, if you have anything you wanna say to me, right? anything that you think you can bring in your defense that you have the courage to stand behind in front of somebody who can competently debate you about it, who is not afraid of you, who knows what he's talking about, right, and who will stand up for the people of this city and not allow you all to just continue to play dumb, right? I invite you to come to the downtown Santa Rosa Library at a time of your choosing and debate with me about it. All right, I think you can, I can do your job better than you, right? I think the people of Santa Rosa think that too, right? I'll be running for office, not today, not tomorrow, but I will be, all right? Debate me about it. Do we have any additional cards? Nope. 
All right, we'll move. Um, Mayor Schwedhelm, may I speak? A, I didn't have time to submit a card. Go ahead, As, Ann. as I sat, Ann Seeley, uh, as I sat in my seat in the lower part of the chamber, I looked across the street and saw an enormous russet potato <laughs> on a trailer. And I know that, Mr. S Sawyer, you have a lot to do with the uh, Burbank Gardens uh, foundation and support. I wonder if you'd like to make an announcement about a celebration there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ely. Any other cards? We have one more. Elizabeth Neon. Oh, hi there. Um, a little, a couple of weeks ago, I forgot what I was talking about while I was talking to you, and what it was is I was going to touch on the fact that uh, the American government disparaged and um, attacked other countries over ideologies. They disparaged socialism and they disparaged communism. And I'm not going to stand on behalf of communism, although I, I think a true communist state would not have a dictator over it. But I've been a socialist all my life, ever since I could think, really. And it's so funny, because I was named Elizabeth Churchill Lloyd at birth, I was felt I must, must, must watch the evening news as a young teenager. And so I was watching it one night, and I'm, I had the thought, what if we're the bad guys? And you know what? <laughs> I don't want to tell you, but we might just be that. Uh, I was just listening to a program on Berkeley Radio about the three big nu nuclear disasters, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima. Yeah, it's pretty serious stuff, and more pollution will just make it harder. And it was interesting, this gal had, that was speaking has studied Chernobyl for, um, for about two decades. And she said that the, the uh, evidence of what happened and how it affected people kept disappearing. And um, yeah, I forget more, any more of that, but let's see. I just wanted to sing a couple lines from one of the Raging Granny songs. And it, it goes like this, it's, it's like, we cultivate our image as we dominate the skies. Let's see if I can do it. So we cultivate our image as we dominate the skies. Not for human rights and values, but big business enterprise. Well, and I'll, just because I haven't done my 4-H pledge for you in a long time, I'll, I'll end with that. You know, I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for the entire world and my family, too. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have for this item. Um, Mr. McGlynn, you want to introduce 16.1? Uh, item. 16.1, public hearing, continued from May 7th and May 28th, 2019, regular year meeting. Roseland Village Mixed Use Project, appeal of Planning Commission action on the tentative map and density bonus for the planned Roseland Village Mixed Use Project located at 665 and 883 Sebastopol Road, Santa Rosa's assessor parcel numbers 125-101-031 and 125-111-037, file number PRJ17-075, MAJ17-006, DB19-001. All right, thank you. Let me outline the order of this meeting. We will first ask for uh, council ex parte communications and staff will do a presentation. Then we have the chair of the planning commission will do a brief presentation. Then the appellant presentation, then the applicant presentation. Then I will open the public hearing for any members of the public who would like to comment on that. Close the public hearing, questions from council. Council has a motion and we move on from there. 
So with that, with the council members present, uh, could I please hear of any ex parte uh, disclosures by council, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I did have a chance to meet with the applicants and received a number of emails on the project. No information was presented that is not publicly available in the staff report. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I met with the appellant bef um, quite some time ago before the appeal was um, put into place, and I did have a meeting with staff for an uh, update on the, cur on the current status. No additional information. Mr. Olivares? Thank you, Mayor. I believe I met with the applicant uh, quite a while ago. Uh, no new information. Thank you, and I've met with the applicant on two separate occasions over several months, uh, but again, as the Vice Mayor mentioned, all the information that was provided to me has been in, contained in all the public documents. Uh, Madam City Attorney, when our colleagues join us, should we stop where we are to get their ex parte communication at that point? Yes. Okay, so for staff, if they do come, if give us a little breathing room to hear from our colleagues about it, if they had any ex parte communications. So, staff presentation, please. Thank you, Andy Gustafson, Senior Planner, um, Mr. Mayor and members of the Council. The matter before you is an appeal of a Planning Commission decision, and let me get back to the start of the slideshow, there we go, uh, of the Roseland Village uh, tentative map and density bonus. Uh, that project was appealed by Mr. Nellison, and uh, the matter before you tonight is uh, a recommendation by staff and by the Planning Commission to uh, deny the appeal and uphold the Commission's action. Um, first, I'd like to just point out this project would provide for 175 units, including 75 of those would be affordable units uh, towards our housing action plan goals. The Planning Commission took two actions when it considered this matter. It was a tentative map that basically sets the stage for the Roseland Village planned project in the future. It establishes um, five parcels on a 7.41 acre lot. It redevelops an existing site uh, with infrastructure, road circulation and such. And it also, uh, the commission at that same time reviewed a requested density bonus, which included uh, three concessions that would allow for a seven, excuse me, a 32% bonus uh, above the general plan density. And they affirmed the project was in fact in compliance with the city's density bonus ordinance and provisions of state law. The project is in, um, at, on Sebastopol Avenue in the Roseland Village area, indicated by the star. It is a Roseland Village neighborhood center uh, shown in that shaded area. This is an illustrative plan prepared by the uh, project team. The applicant is uh, Mid Peninsula. They are the lead uh, contractor, if you will, in the project. It will be supported by Urban Mix, a private uh, developer, and then the underlying property owner is uh, the Sonoma County Community Development Commission. The project would develop a number of buildings on the site, including two apartment structures. Uh, one is commercial, excuse me, uh, market rate 100 units, and the other is 75 affordable units. There would be a one acre park, um, a Mercado store, and also a, a site for a future community library. The proposed uh, tentative map is displayed here and it shows lots would vary between uh, 1.53 acres, which would be the uh, lot one for the affordable housing site, and then lot two is a, a 2.1 acres for the market rate units, and then the other lots are allocated for uh, the Mercado, number four, number three is the um, uh, library site, and then the one acre park is in the middle. With any subdivision uh, of this type, there are a number of site improvements that are a part of the uh, review of the city and when the city uh, planning commission looked at this project, uh, before you see the circulation, the green areas show public streets that would um, extend into the project area or be developed by the subdivision. Um, notably, there would be an extension of West Street north through the project towards a undeveloped 
excuse me, area that um, would have future access to Sebastopol Avenue. The brown or um, yellow arrows on the map indicate private circulation over uh, lots. These would be um, driveways uh, and, and accesses to parking areas on, on these individual lots. I do also want to call your attention on the right-hand side, there's an arrow to a neighboring property, uh, the Paulson property, which is the western half of the Roseland Village Neighborhood Center. I'm sorry, the eastern half of the Roseland Neighborhood Village Center. The density bonus here is illustrated just to show you that um, in a quick snapshot that 133 units would be allowed by the general plan land use designation there today. Uh, the density bonus allows that number to go up to 175 and uh, it's notable here that all of those um, 75 units would be affordable much more than the actual requested density, excuse me, the, the amount of affordability built into the project would qualify much for much more density than is being requested here. Um, there would be 28 uh, affordable units that would be subject to a city housing agreement um, and the rest of the affordable units, uh, number 40, 47, would be subject to uh, affordability requirements through CDC. The remaining 100 units are, um, are intended by Urban Mix, the private property developer for workforce housing. Three concessions were um, reviewed and, and accepted by the Planning Commission, phased development uh, of the affordable housing units after the market rate units, uh, separate apartment, uh, affordable housing apartment and parcel, lots one versus lot two, and then also reduced parking. The phase development um, was a, a technique that is proposed to allow for housing, uh, affordable housing, low income tax credit financing. Um, this is a uh, involved process, takes time and uh, uncoupling or phasing that uh, part of the project would allow that financing to be pursued and not delay the development of the market rate units. Uh, also the market rate lot uh, will be sold by CDC to Urban Mix and the proceeds of sales there would help finance the infrastructure improvements for the site and thus uh, help to reduce the cost of affordable housing development on lot two. And furthermore, the separate uh, lot for the affordable unit or building will allow for long-term operational management by uh, affordable housing entity, MidPen, whose experience and efficiencies will help to ensure that is a long-term maintained project site. Um, the second uh, concession had to do with parking. Uh, I'm sorry, the third concession had to do with parking and um, the traffic study submitted for the project indicated that cumulative, conducted a cumulative uh, parking demand analysis and established that peak parking demand on the property would result in the need for 323 spaces. That is the amount of spaces that are provided on the site. What you see in the shaded green areas are shared parking areas which during the off air, during peak periods would be available to the public but during the off times would be available um, to residents to park. So the remaining amount of parking for the public on site is 148 lots um, or spaces and uh, that amount is um, allowing, uh, fulfilling the complete parking needs for the entire site. Uh, I should also add that the parking study showed that there would be no parking demand on the adjoining property or any other adjoining uh, areas. Um, so the project appeal turns on uh, the idea that this development harms a reciprocal uh, easement between 
the two owners of the Roseland Village Shopping Center. CDC owns the uh, western half, which is the area in dashed line, uh, enclosed area in blue. Um, and Mr. Paulson owns the eastern part, which is the area uh, to the, to the uh, east. And the easement itself is that brown line, um, which shows that it covers uh, virtually all of the CDC ownership as well as uh, the Paulson property. And the concept there is there's a reciprocal access and parking. Historically, when this subdivision or excuse me, shopping center was built, um, the center relied on uh, parking on both sides of that blue line and, al and allowed for circulation across it as well. Um, the appeal was filed um, asserting that the uh, tentative map uh, violates the sh shared access easement, the project ignores the easement's use restriction, and that the, uh, ease the uh, tentative map violates also a concurrent, the concurrent affordable housing construction requirement of the density bonus chapter, and furthermore, that it eliminates over 270 shared parking spaces. With regard to the points, each of these, I, I will say that um, uh, the parking shared access easement um, really it doesn't define any particular alignment or spaces of parking uh, spots available to each and that um, functionally they were uh, undefined, truly open and reciprocal. Um, the driveway alignment uh, was not defined. The green arrow there shows the main circulation across the, the property from east to west. And um, the subdivision which uh, is proposed maintains that circulation access. Recall I, I uh, pointed out the one arrow that uh, crossed across the subdivision or outside the subdivision to the neighboring lot. That continues to provide that east-west crossing into and between Paulson and uh, the CDC property. The second point, um, with regard to uh, use restrictions on the property and that the proposed tentative map uh, might set up development for an improper use. The tentative map does not specify use, but it certainly contemplates planned development of the Roseland Village mixed use project. And that use uh, that would come forward uh, as a minor design review in the future is completely consistent and um, implements the Sebastopol Urban Vision Plan, the General Plan Land Use Designations. It is a uh, highly anticipated project for the Roseland community and is built uh, with a mix of uses at an intensity that is consistent with the General Plan. So, um, the third issue has to do with affordable, you know, the viol violating the concurrent affordable housing construction requirement. Um, one of the concessions, as I mentioned by the, the applicant, was to relax uh, that requirement as permitted when um, it is found that a standard or requirement of the city's code would um, result or increase the cost of affordable housing in the project. The applicant was able to demonstrate that uh, to require concurrent development of the affordable housing units with the market rate units would increase the costs of affordable units by potentially delaying the sale of the market rate unit until financing of the affordable housing tax income credit project or work is done. That is a cumbersome and, and a long-term process and would delay start of construction and thus uh, suppress the value of the land that would be up for sale. So um, in that regard, uh, and also it would uh, not allow the uh, mid-pen to use the financing from the proceed of sale to underwrite the cost of subdivision uh, development. So for that reason, the concession was properly granted by the Planning Commission and uh, does not violate the uh, intent or the express purpose of the density bonus ordinance. Finally, uh, the project does eliminate 270 uh, 
it, the project is asserted to eliminate 270 shared parking spaces. Um, once again, uh, the recorded easement does not uh, require or specify a certain number of unit, uh, parking spaces on the lot. And uh, the parking analysis was able to show, and I must point out a correction to a number there, um, that it's not 108, but it's 148 uh, parking spaces on site that are available to the public, including any patron of this of the uh, property, uh, of the Paulson property businesses. Um, so in that regard, uh, this tentative map does not harm or uh, uh, constrain the uh, easement between the parties, nor does it conflict with or uh, is it contradictory with a city developed parking standard. The project, when it was uh, acted on by the Planning Commission, was found to comply, to fulfill two CEQA exemptions. Um, first, it's consistent with the specific plan, general plan in the area. Um, the impacts associated with land use development on that site as contemplated by the specific plan um, were full, fully analyzed, the, the potential effects that this project will have, and thus there's no change or increase in magnitude of impacts that uh, could occur here that have not been previously analyzed. And there are no particular as things that have emerged or information, new information that's emerged about this particular project site that would render the analysis that was conducted with those, with the specific plan and the general plan uh, EIRs that would warrant additional analysis here. This is an urban lot. There are no uh, special habitat areas or endangered species located here. Um, and there have been no unanalyzed impacts that, um, or, or I should say any potential adverse impacts that would um, not be mitigated or reduced to a level that's insignificant uh, when we can apply uniform rules uh, from our uh, development code. So uh, with, with the findings that the Planning Commission made uh, with respect to compliance with the subdivision ordinance and the um, CEQA review, uh, staff is recommending that the council deny the appeal, uphold or affirm the Planning Commission's action and approve the tentative map and um, uh, find that the project qualifies for the density bonus and concessions. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Before we go to questions, uh, council members, can we, uh, any ex parte communications, Mr. Tibbetts? No, I, I think I spoke with MidPen about a year ago briefly on this project. It was a long time ago, um, but I have not spoken with anybody else. Ms. Lemmy? Uh, MidPen and CDC approached me a few weeks ago. Nothing was disclosed that has not been shared with the public. Thank you. And Ms. Combs? I've met with MidPen and um, I've received a number of emails. I don't think anything is in addition to the information that we have now. Great, thank you. Council, any questions on the presentation? Seeing none, we have our planning commissioner here, Ms. Cisco. would you like to make some comments about the planning commission's process? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, tell you our process on this project, uh, which as Mr. Gustafson said, it was for a tentative map and a density bonus with three concessions. There were five of us present, two absent that evening. Um, we heard, as you just did, uh, what the three uh, concessions were and that, that there would be no concurrent construction. The dispersal uh, was going to not happen. It was going to be all located in one building and the parking reduction. Staff explained to us what the findings would need to be made that uh, a financial basis uh, to aid the uh, building of the affordable housing had to be one of the findings and um, that it wouldn't be of harm to the environment. So in supporting those concessions, that's what we were going to be listening to. Um, the applicant team uh, 
came forward and gave a lot of explanations, complicated explanations, which I'm sure you will hear, <laughs> about why those concessions are necessary and about how we could uh, successfully make the findings to grant those concessions. They also, uh, in their presentation, explain the, the very lengthy community outreach on this project, the, uh, their efforts to make sure that the site remains activated during construction with the Plaza Temporal, a number of uh, sort of interesting ways to keep the site, which frankly has always been active uh, legally or <laughs> illegally, but that they're really taking care to do that. And that they would be having different architects for each building so that the de designs wouldn't just be like one massive uh, architecture. Our public hearing was just a little bit over an hour. Uh, we did hear from the applicant and his attorney with some of the uh, appeal comments that you see up there with Mr. Paulson concerned about his easements, the terrible traffic in general, the under parking, uh, and <clears throat> While it wasn't specifically brought up, the uh, the parking easement wasn't specifically brought up. We did have in our materials county council's letter explaining that the the building or approval of this project would not interfere with the reciprocal easements that are uh, on file. So we had that in front of us. And in our discussions, we did uh, call on our uh, city attorney to comment on that letter and to confirm that that was uh, the, the case, that we wouldn't be approving something that was going to be interfering with those easements. Um, with our public hearing, we heard a lot from the youth about the meaning of the Boys and Girl Girls Club to them. And again, uh, Midpen addressed those concerns about trying to find an interim plan for both the library and for the, the youth there, which uh, was great to hear. Um, when it came to our discussion, uh, again, I think we found that we could make the findings for the concessions. I think we were generally very favorable uh, towards the project. Uh, and while ideally we would have the affordable housing disperse, we could appreciate and understand the reasons for the concession. And so with that, we approved uh, the project with five eyes and two of us absent. So if you have any questions, I'm available. Great, thank you for sharing. Council, any questions for Chair Cisco? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Thank you, Chair Cisco, for that good play-by-play. -play. You said something at the very end that I wanted to touch on and, and try to understand more deeply, and that was about the separation of the affordable housing from the market rate housing and the reason for why that had to be so, because a lot of us up here have definitely had conversations about this, this, the benefits of mixed income housing, you know, where you can't distinguish uh, a deed restricted door from a market rate door, and there's clearly a, a delineation here. Um, can you elaborate on that? Well, I certainly can't elaborate on the complexities of the financing. Definitely, you will hear that from, from MidPen. Um, but we were satisfied that those, uh, those financing conditions existed. We certainly were assured by MidPen that the the building itself, it would not look like an affordable housing project in the middle of market rate housing, that there would be efforts made to make sure that it's integrated well. But as to the, the financing complexities, all I can tell you is they explain them. I couldn't repeat them sure, if my life tough. depended on it, but th that they do exist in that um, that concession was necessary to uh, to grant. So. Did you hear any comments uh, in this regard from members of the community? Uh, no, not at all. That w was not a concern for the members of the community. Again, the concerns were really about traffic, uh, parking, housing that dense in general, 
those were the negative comments. And, and there were certainly a lot of favorable comments about the, you know, the community's been waiting for sure. this area to be developed forever and have been participating in planning with it uh, forever. Yeah. So the main concerns were really the youth and the displacement. And again, I think the, the planning commission was uh, uh, appreciative of this particular applicant's uh, awareness of that and trying to work with the city, the library, and the youth to make sure that uh, everybody's got a place to go while the construction is happening. And in particular, that the community continue c to have a place to go with the Plaza Temporal while, while it's uh, being built. Okay, thanks so much, Mayor. If it's all right with you, uh, when Midpen does their piece of the presentation, I'll ask the oh, same question. Absolutely, then. we'll have time for more questions. Any other questions for Chair Cisco? Well, we done, Mr. Tibbetts? What's that? With, with Chair Cisco, any no, questions I'm, for Thank her? you. We're done. Ms. Combs? Almost. Okay. <laughs> As the Planning Commission, I'm looking at the tentative map on, on slide six, that might help. As the Planning Commission looked at the tentative map, I'm assuming you also saw a U-shaped building and an L-shaped building? We did. They called it a C-shaped building and an L-shaped building. Okay, I'm standing in the wrong <laughs> But we place saw both of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It was, did anyone ask or was, it's gone, any reason given for why one of the wings of the C couldn't be swapped with one of the wings of the L so that some affordable could be on each side of the road rather than there be a wrong side of the road. Was that ever discussed at the Planning Commission? We did not discuss that. We did discuss uh, some of the circulation and some of uh, the crossings of Joe Redota Trail and West Avenue, but we didn't talk about moving the buildings around. Okay, or any of the elements of the building? No. Okay. Does, does staff know, did the Design Review Board discuss that? Have they discussed that? Uh, the, I can't be certain what uh, was discussed with the Design Review Board. Um, but at the meeting with regard to the separation of the affordable and the market rate units by parcel, the rationale was the parcel and the building um, of the market rate units would not be encumbered by the more lengthy, complicated low-income tax credit process. Um, if they were blended, whether they were mixed door-to-door -door or two separate buildings on the same parcel, they would be, the market rate unit financing would be slowed down May as I, a result. Are, are we not creating the parcels? Uh, I mean, have the parcels already been created or I thought we were in the process of creating these parcels? That's correct, the parcel. So it would be possible to create a parcel that was mm -hmm. one of the wings of one of the buildings so that it was a separated parcel even if it was adjacent to the other wings. Got it. I understand. Near okay, what you're so these, yeah. aren't, these parcels are not pre-existing set in stone parcels. They That's are correct. being discussed today. If I may ask the city attorney, um, can we have this conversation with regard to um, the layout of the parcels or the uh, segregation of the affordable housing or can we only rule today on the denial of the um, appeal or to deny or not to deny the appeal? No, on appeal, the entire project is before you and you may discuss all of the elements of the project. So the whole project is before us? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Chair Cisco? Thank you for that presentation. Ms. Combs, did you have questions for staff that you wanted to about their original presentation? I think I snuck them in already. If I have more, I'll come back. Great. Okay, we now have the appellant presentation. And you'll have 10 minutes for your presentation. If you could Thank please you. identify yourself. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of city council, my name is John Paulson. 
I'm the owner of the Roseland Village Shopping Center, 555 Sebastopol Road through 673 Sebastopol Road. I'm the neighbor directly east of the CDC Midpen project approved by the planning department. And I filed the appeal, which is before you today. The Roseland Village Shopping Center was built in the mid 1950s by Hugh Cotting and my father, Vigo Paulson. Since there were two separate owners, in order to protect their investments, Cotting and my father prepared, signed, and recorded reciprocal easements. Not only are the easements affecting and maintaining shared parking, circulation, and limited development to commercial use only, the easements are prescriptive, having been in use and uninterrupted since the 1950s. Well, thank you. The easement was known to the CDC when they purchased the property from the Baugh family. John Haig from the CDC many years ago said to me that something needed to be done about the easement before development could occur. Nothing has been done. No, no uh, negotiations, discussions, discussions, nothing. Yet MidPen, with funding from the CDC, went ahead with the plans that were approved by the Planning Commission that totally ignore the shared parking, circulation, and commercial use only recorded easement. Their plans reduce shared parking on their parcel from 270 spaces to, I just saw it tonight, 61 spaces. The density bonus and reduced parking requirements approved by the planning department will mean that extra cars of their tenants in their one, two, and three bedroom apartments will park on my side of the shopping center, eliminating parking for my retail tenant customers. The first phase approved is for 100 market rate, one, two, and three bedroom apartments. This seems odd that CDC property meant for affordable housing is going for market rate. Additionally, the location of the 100 market rate apartments will completely block circulation of delivery trucks who deliver to Camacho Market as well as tenants that park behind the businesses and need access to the signalized intersection at West Avenue. County Council has informed my attorney that an expert claims that 40 foot delivery trucks can turn around in the back and exit the way they came in. All the truck drivers I spoke with said, impossible. At numerous meetings held by the CDC mid-pen, my issues of parking and circulation have come up. One meeting attendees were given colored pens and a site plan of both properties to draw what was important to them, red being the most important. I participated in that meeting. The red color I drew circulation behind my property up to West Avenue. This has been totally ignored. I asked the city council to review the planning departments, to reverse the planning department's approval of mid pens plans to allow 100 market rate apartments be built blocking my access of circulation. Before any plans can be approved on the CDC property, the recorded and prescriptive parking, circulation, and development easements must be resolved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Council, any questions for the appellant? Was it a yes, Mr. Tibbetts, or anyone with any questions? No. Thank you for that presentation. Now we have a 10 minute applicant presentation. Excuse me. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, thank you. I'm Robert Nellison, representing Roseland Village Corporation and John Paulson. For a hamburger today, I will gladly pay you tomorrow. The oldest trick in the book in the City of Santa Rosa is falling for it. The City of Santa Rosa needs mixed income housing. Member Tibbetts correctly observed that mixed income housing is encouraged if not mandated by state law. Yet surprise, the proposed housing to be built is all, I repeat, all market rate. 
for the benefit of all present and our press Democrat reporters so they can honestly address the issue that only market rate housing is going to be built, as we know from the covert admissions of mid -Penn. When I say now, I mean funded, shovel ready in process. There's no consequence for failure to build mixed income housing, no consequence whatsoever. Roseland Village, Roseland, Santa Rosa, Sonoma County all need mixed income housing. It is needed now. It is not happening. You have no excuse for not requiring it now. Was the city suckered or is it complicit? I hope the former and fear the latter, which is where the rub comes in. Roseland Village asks, why give away to a South of Bay developer of market rate housing, extensive public funds and benefits, and do so on the back of the tax paying and impacted community with a high density bonus and a parking waiver? Roseland Village objects to the lack of transparency, to the willingness of the county, the city, and Midpen to pretend that the recorded and prescriptive traffic and public easements neither matter to nor impact on Roseland Village. From the beginning, John Paulson tried to work with the CDC and Midpen to maintain the necessary and existing traffic access and parking easements. And he has not only been ignored, but even expressly threatened directly with financial ruin. Who benefits from the failure to ensure mixed income housing, from abandoning property density restrictions and parking requirements and giving away public funds? Certainly not the city of Santa Rosa or Sonoma County taxpayers who will foot the bill. I also ask why the city of Santa Rosa encourages those with no interest in the property, such as Midpen, which is not prepared to build any mixed income housing at this time, and its own city of Santa Rosa staff to conceal the county's admitted communications that there are recorded and historical easements preventing the proposed market rate development, but not the mixed income housing. So until my time runs out, I'm gonna observe number one, you have the letters, I'm sorry, the emails from the attorneys from Midpen and uh, Urban Mix saying, we have no interest in this property. So we should not be included in the litigation to have a judicial determination that the easement says what it means, I'm sorry, the easement says what it says, means what it means, and the 50 years of use and I personally have observed that use since 1983, that use has been continuous on a daily basis and is destroyed by the proposed plan of Midpen. Midpen resisted at every stage, making any modification of its plan to keep that access going. Midpen would not even talk to Mr. Paulson about the easement which says, this is going to remain commercial property and Mr. Paulson's willingness and even, and, and even welcoming some residential development to occur with the commercial development, but it cannot occur at the expense of his traffic access and his access to West Avenue, and it cannot occur when it destroys his parking access, which is clearly in writing and clearly has been used, and we have photographs going back many years for that. So, if you, so unfortunately, you're um, uh, as, as pleasant as has been, Mr. Gustafsson uh, does not have uh, 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 an accurate presentation. He's towing the county's party line on their desire to do away with, by hoping, that the city of Santa Rosa will ignore the clear recorded easements. Have any of you viewed the written easement? You all know Hugh Cotting, he didn't give away something for nothing, or I think most of you knew him. He and Vigo Paulson had an agreement that they put in writing. It was very clear, it was very straightforward, and it was used continuously for the last 50 years. So to say that that means nothing, I think flies in the face of anybody who ever understood or had any experience with even third hand Hugh Cotting and what was done with that shopping center. We welcome and encourage 
the mixed income housing, which should be built there, which can be built there, which can be built there with the minimum amount of imagination and some cooperation attempts by MidPen, which as the attorney's email say, we have no interest in this. Why are you even entertaining, is a question I'm asking, the request by MidPen if they have no interest in the property? All right, thank you. Council, any questions? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mrs. Gallagher, uh, I had the chance to read the Deputy County Council's opinion on this issue, and it states that the easement is not defined by a location, because that was my initial question, was if they had a location and the easement infringed upon the property line of the mid pen, then we would have a problem. We'd have to probably, they could stop it or lead to settlement or something along those lines. Have you had the chance to verify that there is no boundary definition and do you think that's sufficient to avoid litigation that could delay this project into the future? Um, I have, we have confirmed that there is no location that's um, at issue in within the easement uh, in terms of whether that um, conclusion precludes litigation, I, I, I can't say that. Um, Fair enough. They, they have, uh, the applicant has already filed suit um, against the county, so that litigation is ongoing at this point, to my knowledge. Okay, but we are confident that there is, there does not exist an easement defining. That's correct. The easement boundary. is not specific as to location. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Council, any other questions? Mr. Vice Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, you kept mentioning that MidPen doesn't have an interest in the property. I, I wanted to clarify or allow you to clarify, you don't mean that they're not interested in the property, you mean that they have no actual ownership stake in that property and are instead acting under the authority of the CDC, correct? Hold, hold on one second, let's get your microphone on for a second. Thank you. Their attorney put into exact words what their attorney said. We have no interest in the property. Now, if what they mean but, but is- But interest from a legal perspective, meaning ownership. From a legal perspective, you can have an option to purchase, which gives you an interest in the property. You can have an, a memorandum of understanding, which gives you an interest in the property. I'm taking the attorney who knows how to use words at face value, they have no interest in the property. That's why I gave you the sum total of exactly what he said. We have no interest in the property. And I, and I understand and I, and I know you're not in, intending to do it this way, but for example, council members have to disclose when we have an interest in an issue and that's actually a clearly defined legal term to mean an economic interest. So an economic, whether we have part ownership, we have derived uh, 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 salary from it, interest actually has a, a, a legal term. I just wanted to make sure and clarify how you intended interest when you keep pointing out that they have no interest. First, I intended the council members to read the email from mid Pench attorney which said, quote, we have no interest. But you raise a very interesting point, which is what haven't they disclosed? What they haven't disclosed, which they have admitted exists, are the communications from the county saying, yes, there is an easement that is problematic. I've been promised it. It hasn't been provided. It was referenced before the planning commission. I, it hasn't been provided. I think it's in your interest to get exactly all the communications which went back and forth from the county, encouraging the city to do its bidding and, 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 and basically rubber stamp this application when as a mid pen attorneys put in writing, they have no interest and somebody is trying to convince you that a written easement, which has been in effect for 50 years, which by prescription establishes the usage is meaningless. It isn't meaningless. And why the council is being asked to swallow this whole, I don't understand, but I was not given it and I was promised it. I assume you have not been given it. 
you should ask for it. And I appreciate that, sir. And I will ask the applicants to disclose if they have any interest uh, as we understand it from a legal perspective uh, to be understood in the property. Uh, and just as a helpful tip, I, I believe that the county should have provided the easement to you if you don't have the text. You also have a uh, Public Records Act request you could file because that would be a public document and you would be entitled to it under that. Normally when people promise they're gonna do something, I expect them to do it and we're under a short timeline. I've been promised the formal documents on or about August 23rd. Okay, Council, any additional questions? Ms. Combs. Has our city attorney seen the document that's being referred to as an easement? Yes, we have. I'm a little unclear at this point um, uh, exactly what he's referring to, but we have seen the copy of the easement that's at issue uh, in the litigation. Can you clarify for me? Um, I, I'm finding I'm a little confused. Generally, an easement is like you can drive from here to here along this stretch of road, you know, through through my property. You know, the the the, the water line can go here, or another road could go there. Does I'm, what I'm hearing is this document doesn't say it that way. That's that. Uh, I must admit I haven't. Um, I have looked at the easement, but I haven't looked at it in the last week or so. Um, and um, it is my recollection that it does not. I know it doesn't specify specific parking spaces. Um, it does provide for reciprocal use and for access. Um, and I don't know if either staff is more familiar with this particulars of the easement or. What does it mean when we say there's access? If it doesn't say you have access at this point, does that mean that there's access throughout the property? What does that mean? I just, I'm just asking because I don't know. Let me, while, while this proceeds on, I'll pull up a copy of the easement and I'll be able to address Thank those you. questions it, more specifically. As we move forward, I may yeah. want to ask questions about that in more sure. detail. Thanks. Sure, Thank you. Council member, can I offer that I live in West County. I live on a private easement of a road, as do most of my neighbors, if not half of West County. And all it says is, if it's in writing, which mine wasn't until I moved there, the bank required it. For almost 100 years, people simply drove on what was there with nothing recorded. If a recorded easement says a 10 foot, as mine does, a 10 foot strip of land along the western boundary, do you think it goes directly along the western boundary and it makes a 90 degree angle, which would make it impassable for trucks or farm equipment, because you can't make that 90 degree angle. Everybody makes the U. Everybody knows you make the U. Everybody knows if you've got a creek on one side, you're not actually gonna be driving in the creek. You're gonna be driving close to the creek, but not in the creek, even if the creek is the first four or five feet of the property line. So you have a recorded easement, which establishes there's an easement, you better pay attention, and you've got the actual use, which defines the scope of that easement. And if somebody's been driving up and down that easement for 50 years on a daily basis with farm trucks and residential uh, um, cars, you don't suddenly say, oh, we have no idea why you're driving on this piece of land. All right, thank you, sir, for that. Any other questions from council? Okay, we'll then go to the applicant presentation from MidPen, and you will also have 10 minutes and then questions after. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, honorable members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. My name is Ben Wickham. Uh, I'm with the Sonoma County Community Development Commission and project lead for the Roseland Village project. Uh, back in 2007, the Sebastopol Road Urban Vision Plan was adopted, at which time uh, the, the community and the neighborhood uh, envisioned this, this location as a community commons. Uh, in 2011, the, the Development Commission purchased this site using redevelopment agency dollars um, and has been spending uh, successor agency dollars to continue the work of 
of developing the site. In 2016, uh, we engaged in a robust uh, competitive process uh, which uh, saw multiple proposals from developers. We chose mid Penn Housing as the most qualified uh, developer with the best proposal. And uh, over two years after that, there was a, an extensive amount of community engagement to get an idea of what the community, the Roseland neighborhood, wanted to see. Uh, and since 2015, the Development Commission has provided free space for the Roseland Library and the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, to, to promote that uh, amenity in the community. In 2000, uh, December 2017, the Santa Rosa uh, Design Review Board approved the initial design, and then in February 2019, uh, as you know, we received Planning Commission approval for our tentative map application. And so for some additional information, I'd like to introduce Jan Lindenthal with MidPen Housing. Good evening. My name is Jan Lindenthal. I'm the Chief Real Estate Development Officer at MidPen Housing. MidPen is a nonprofit, mission based affordable housing developer. We were founded in 1970 by a group of citizens who were concerned about affordable housing in the, on the San Mateo County Peninsula, which is where our name comes from, of MidPen. That's where we started. Now, 49 years later, we've built more than 8,000 homes in 10 counties, from Monterey to up in Sonoma County here. Um, we also have offices in Foster City, Oakland, Watsonville, and right here in Santa Rosa. As I mentioned, we've developed 8,000 homes over our 49-year history, over 100 communities. One um, completed community is here in Sonoma County. That's the Fetters apartment in the Springs. There's a, an additional 40 unit senior community that's under construction right now. And actually applications are available now for um, qualified seniors who are interested and they'll be taken until July 9th. In addition to building affordable homes, MidPen Housing is also a property manager, so we manage everything that we build ourselves with our own staff. We also have our own resident services corporation, so we're providing services on site to our residents. Um, in family communities like what we're proposing here in Roseland, that will include adult education classes, after school programs, a summer program, um, and so we're, we're very committed to providing those services on site. This uh, project is a, a little different than a typical new development that includes market rate and affordable housing. MidPen Housing is the master developer of this community. We selected Urban Mix, and Keith McCoy is here. He's the principal with Urban Mix. We selected Urban Mix to be our partner, and we designed this new community so that the two components, the two housing components, could proceed independent of one another and not be dependent on one another one another to enable us to move as quickly as possible. We really turn that concept of a traditional inclusionary housing community on its head by putting the nonprofit as the lead master developer. We brought in the, non the market rate partner on our terms. If we can as pause for just a second, we're having some technical difficulties. Sure. Do, we, do we need to reset the whole system? Okay, so if we can just pause, sure. break where you are now, let's take a 10 minute break and once we get, because the microphones will go out too, so once we reset, we'll pick up where you left off. Thank you.
Okay, folks, I think we're ready to start. Okay, which we were on. So, Jan, why don't you pick it up where you'd like to start off again, and then hopefully now we have a slideshow that corresponds with your comments. Thank you. Um, I was mentioning that this project is a little different than other subdivisions in that mid Penn Housing is the master developer and we selected Urban Mix to be our partner. And we designed this community to be integrated, but also for the individual components to be able to proceed independently so that we could build housing as quickly as possible. We have done a lot of community outreach, as you heard from staff and from the Planning Commission member. Uh, we had four community meetings, three design workshops, over 260 community members participated. What did we hear? We heard that people wanted a mix of homes, both in terms of the affordability and the size of the homes. People wanted an economic development opportunity. Next slide. Um, they wanted to make sure that there's a feature on the site that would generate um, economic opportunity, both in terms of jobs and um, job opportunities, as well as business opportunities. People also wanted, of course, a vibrant public plaza for community gathering, and we took a lot of input and had a design charrette to engage the community in actually developing the plan for the plaza. A multi-use civic building was something that we heard about a lot. That's an amenity that the Roseland neighborhood doesn't have today, a, a place where meetings could be held, Zumba classes, things like that, a, a brand new, well-appointed um, building. People also wanted to see opportunities for public art, and that's something that we will not only incorporate into the new community, but that we're incorporating right now in that we are planning a mural by a local muralist on the hardware store building that will um, be painted this summer. People also wanted to make sure that the plan provided a sense of community and that it was safe and accessible. Next. Our vision for Roseland Village is a master plan that is designed as a neighborhood with lots of opportunity for community connection, both between the residential buildings where we'll share uses and amenity spaces, as well as with the other uses on site, where you could run into a neighbor at the plaza or at the Mercado, or when you're visiting one of the other buildings. We also are providing access to the Joe Redota Trail. And we also took care to design this new community to respect the existing reciprocal easement. We met with Mr. Paulson more than 12 times. We took input from him directly. We actually asked him for a plan and incorporated that into our feedback as well as into our submission to the county. And so just a, a review of kind of where we're at with this project. Uh, once we receive entitlement approval, uh, then we'll go, go ahead to seek final map and improvement plan approval. Uh, from the planning department. Hopefully that'll be early 2020 and immediately begin infrastructure improvements uh, in, in the summer of 2020. And that's gonna include building the, the park or the plaza uh, and uh, the CDC will be responsible for maintaining that on into the future. Um, in addition, uh, the, the portion that is gonna go to Urban Mix will be, they'll be paying market rate for that, uh, an appraised price for that parcel, which will really subsidize the rest of the development. So we hope to begin housing construction in winter of 2020 or early 2021, but we have a plan to activate the site early with the Plaza Temporal that was mentioned uh, as early as late summer, early fall of this year. Um, and in addition, we, we've received a, $2.5 million grant from the State Water Board to clean up the environmental pollution that was left by the dry cleaner on the site. So there's a lot of resources uh, and energy that the county's putting into improving the neighborhood uh, by means of this site. So this is a, a schematic of the Plaza Temporal that we're envisioning. It's gonna involve local food vendors, local food, and uh, create a community gathering space that the community has been waiting for for many, many years. So we're excited to deliver this early. So um, I'll turn it back over to Jen. So this is one community that's designed as a neighborhood. Although the individual residential buildings will be financed separately, they're designed to work together as a neighborhood. The Housing to be developed by Urban Mix is affordable housing by design. It's multifamily rental housing, 
that will serve the missing middle, which means people who make too much to qualify for traditional affordable housing programs, but not enough to afford a brand new luxury apartment. The Mid-Pen community will provide multifamily rental housing for large families, one to three bedrooms, serving a range of incomes from as low as 30% of area median income up to 60% of area median income. And that could be families earning as little as $12,000 up to $65,000, so a very wide range. The public funding that we intend to secure will allow us to provide that deep level of affordability, as well as to provide more homes than what we could provide otherwise. The time is now to build this affordable housing. I know that you all know that. There are state sources available based on Props 1 and 2 being passed last fall. We have more than $6 billion available at the state level that we can access to fund projects like this. And this project is ready to go. With your denial of the appeal tonight, we can hit the ground running in securing those state sources. Also, the affordable housing is not dependent upon the market rate housing to move forward. In fact, we expect that it will proceed um, first. The CDC is also committed to building the infrastructure, um, and that is something that is also isn't dependent upon the market rate housing. And I hope we could have just another minute or two, given the delay, um, just to finish our presentation. Yes. Thank you. A couple more minutes. So finally, MidPen is prepared to deliver on this. We've raised over a billion dollars in debt and equity to finance affordable housing in the last five years alone. We've secured more than 20 awards of tax credits. We know how to get this done. We have the track record of being able to secure these precious state funding to be able to make this project a reality. And just finally, we're excited about the potential for the Boys and Girls Club and Sonoma County Library to share space in the civic building that's envisioned. We're working hard with the library and uh, Boys and Girls Club to make that a reality. And uh, that's something, again, the community desperately needs and wants. So uh, I just want to emphasize that for the Development Commission, this is really, for us, it's a flagship project. Um, we believe that uh, it's, it's something that we owe to the community, and we're putting tremendous resources into it. Um, we, and just as Jan expressed, we're determined to get this project uh, completed to deliver affordable housing, workforce housing, a library, a Boys and Girls Club, a new park, a Mercado, and, and all the infrastructure that's involved in supporting that. So we think it's a wonderful opportunity for, for the residents. Great, thank you. Council, questions for the applicant, Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. I've, I've got a couple of questions um, for MidPen, and I wanna thank you all for the work that you do. I'm pretty familiar with your, your nonprofit organization. Um, I actually remember when I first came back from college, uh, I used to work with the Economic Development Board as an intern, and they would many times send me over there uh, to be part of these community input gathering meetings that led to you getting getting the contract to move this thing forward. I was there with uh, Mr. Suarez and others who I see in the audience. Um, so, but I do have some questions, and these are some questions that I have and also some questions that my constituents have, and they're not intended to be a, a reflection of the good work that you do. But um, have you in the past, one of the concerns that I've heard from constituents is you build the market rate housing piece and then it's, it's difficult or you don't end up building the affordability piece. Now you mentioned that you've done, did I hear you say thousands of projects over the lineage of your organization and have you ever had an instance where you were unable to build the affordable piece for whatever reason? No, we've built more than 8,000 units over 8, our units. Um, history, 100 communities. Um, when we've had a master plan like this, we have never had a, a situation where we haven't been able to build the affordable component. In fact, we partnered with Urban Mix to build a master plan in Foster City called Foster Square. And in that case, the city required the affordable housing to go first, and we made it happen on schedule. In this case, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, those, the two projects are not dependent on one another. Mm -hmm. So we don't need the market rate to go forward. The only thing that we need is the denial of this appeal and our ability to compete for state funding and then we, and the, the CDC to commit the infrastructure which they are committed to doing. Mm -hmm. So that's really the gating issue for us, not the market rate component. Okay, um, let me follow up on that then. So uh, you mentioned you need to get your application. I assume this is for low-income housing tax credit and other fund funds available. Uh, so if, if this, if we were to uphold the appeal tonight and cause you a delay, 
would that negate you from being able to get in on time? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we couldn't move forward if our if the appeal was granted. Okay. Um, I, I appreciate uh, you answering my questions, and um, I, I think it's a good project. Council, other questions, Mr. Vice Mayor. Following up on Councilmember Tibbetts question, you just mentioned that there have been instances where uh, in the master plan it, it was conditioned ahead of time that you'd build the affordable units before you came back and did the market rate. Are there any conditions that exist that would prevent you from being able to do the project if this council did that? Can I just, sorry, can I ask if you just kind of repeat that question? I'm not exactly sure what was asked. <laughs> The, the information that was offered is that past projects this, that have been done with cities have been conditioned to require the affordable units to be built first and then came back and did the market rate. Is there anything in this project that would prevent you from moving forward if this council chose to do that as well? Well, it's, 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 it's hard to say for sure. You know, I think the CDC uh, has this is a unique project. It's something that probably won't be, see, you won't see something like it or haven't seen anything like it because uh, we are the owner of the property. And so we're responsible for building the affordable housing by virtue of health and safety code as it relates to the dollars we use to buy it and the dollars we've used so far, almost 10 million total to do pre-development and, and committed to the infrastructure. So we are bound by California state law to build affordable housing on this site. So I think, Placing an additional covenant on it, 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 I don't know that that would be necessary because our our commitment to affordable housing is even uh, separate from MidPens, and we continue to be the title holder until they obtain their financing and take title. Understood. Thank you. Any other Ms. Fleming. Can you? Just clarify for both myself and the public why it is the case that both uh, the market rate and the affordable units can't be built simultaneously. Well, theoretically, they could. What we're saying is we're, use, we're using the, the we're selling the market rate parcel to the market rate developer for for market value. So that's roughly two million dollars that we're going to use to subsidize. Uh, the infrastructure and the affordable housing. So, I mean, we all know there's a terrible challenge with getting affordable housing built because there's not enough local money. Uh, and that is, that's, that's one of the, the big issues that's slowing down affordable projects from being built in this county and in the city of Santa Rosa. And so, so, okay. so the, the reason that, as was explained, I think the reason the Planning Commission approved that is to not only facilitate putting that money into the affordable project, um, but also because the community needs housing, period. And uh, by allowing that, that market rate housing can, can go forward at its own speed. Okay, and following on with uh, the, what the vice mayor said um, around an additional co covenant, you said some, if it's not um, that the CDC has a mandate to build affordable housing on this land, Given that we see hiccups happen all the time and we have a potential softening of the market, um, I'm wondering if, though not necessary to have an additional covenant, if it would be problematic for you in any way. Well, I don't, if, if, the, if the city put a covenant on that parcel to require affordable housing to be built, I don't know that that would be necessarily problematic. Uh, the, the, the Sonoma County has already put $2.5 million into the affordable housing development, and so we are gonna deed restrict that parcel as soon as MidPen takes title to it and that deed restriction will go for 55 years. If the city wanted to put uh, some kind of interim deed restriction uh, on that parcel as part of the approval, it, 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 wouldn't, it, it wouldn't cause a problem for us necessarily. I don't think that would be a, a big issue. I think it's understood by all of us that we do need housing, really, you know, market rate housing and and affordable housing, we need it all. And so my question is, Is was there any discussion at the CDC about the um, exclusionary nature of this type of housing? And I'm wondering how you would address the fact that I'm not sure that, you know, recently my parents sold a house in a tract in, in San Leandro and with it, it still has the original rules that you can't sell it to a person of color. That still goes, runs with the property in 2018. 
And I'm wondering how in 50 years, if people are gonna be looking at me like, did, did this not look like redlining? And so I'm wondering what kinds of conversations you had at the CDC to address the potential civil rights issues around economic discrimination and what we know to be the outcomes for children who grow up in segregated housing. Well, I think again, as Jan pointed out, we look at this seven acre development as one, one community. And the simple virtue of the economics of affordable housing make it, make it very, very difficult to envision something other than uh, one, one apartment development on one side that's affordable, funded with low-income housing tax credits, and then the other side being affordable by design. I think the amenities that are gonna be provided, a new infrastructure, a park, uh, walking to stores and food, a mercado, the library, the Boys and Girls Club, those amenities are gonna be available to everyone living in this community. The quality of development and construction is gonna be the same. So really, uh, by, by making the 75 unit development that you saw on the tentative map affordable, we're facilitating the financing of that. So we, really, we can't build affordable housing at 60% and 30% without the millions and millions of dollars of low income housing tax credit equity that's required. And that's just the way that federal program is set up. It's designed to go into uh, one, one, one development, one building. So we, we, we feel like this is not an example of, of segregation, it's an example of inclusion and giving everyone access to amenities they probably would, would not have access to right, no. if this I, was I mean, I understand that the financing is difficult, but not impossible. And I also have the experience of having grown up in San Leandro, just a block or two away from East Oakland, and the outcomes, even though they, they ha you could walk to the same park that was in my neighborhood, you could go to the same school, the outcome for people, even in very close proximity with these types of things built in is, in my experience, and in not just my experience, is really dif difficult. So what I'm trying to ask is not about the funding. What I'm trying to ask, and nobody here is in doubt that we need housing. What I'm trying to ask is what kinds of conversations were had about the potential fallout from this type of discrimination. And the proximity, the fact is, is that doesn't sway me much. I wanna hear what, are, what was the thought process behind this, just besides getting the housing built. Well, our thought process is that we have to work within the constraints of, of what's possible in terms of delivering this project and what was envisioned back in 2007. So uh, as much as, you know, potentially we would, we would say we'd love to develop, to, to put forth 175 units of affordable housing. Uh, financially, that's, that's, that's not, not, not only is it not feasible, it's not what the community asked for. They asked for a mixed income development. So in order to de deliver units that are deeply affordable, we have to bring in federal tax credits. And, and so that's part of the strategy, is trying to address the full range of the housing continuum in, in this project. And, and if I might just add that um, there's, there's a, a difference here with, with the way that affordable housing is financed today and the way, the way that MidPen finances affordable housing that doesn't provide the same, doesn't, doesn't in include the same kind of constraints and limitations that public housing used to, used to include. For example, the families that move into this community have to be income qualified on the day they move in. After that, their income can go up and their income does go up. So although, and we believe that even the 30, percent to 60 percent, you know, families earning as little as 12,000 up to 65,000 is already very integrated, that the opportunity for those families to be able to improve their station in life, to get a better job, to go back to school, to increase their economic potential, what that means is that the community becomes even more integrated over time. And that's what our history over 49 years has taught us. So the, these, this is not the kind of affordable housing community or, or neighborhood that perhaps you experienced as a young person. The other thing I would add is that this is well-managed, service-rich housing. So this is housing that's, that's managed to the same standard as or better than any other property in the city of Santa Rosa, and certainly equal to what our partner will be, will be building. 
what, what this allows us to do is to produce more units that are more deeply affordable, and that's the, that's the choice that we're making. Otherwise, we'd be producing probably half as many or fewer affordable homes here. And, and we don't think that's, we, we think this can be done in a way that's successful, that's vibrant, that's, that's really integrated in meaningful ways in terms of, of people knowing their neighbors and visiting with each other and, and that economic upward mobility that we all want. Um, so we, we don't think that this design constrains that. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Combs? Thank you. Can we have the circulation and access plan on the overhead? It's, it was given to us as part of the, uh, part of the applicant's package. It, it looks, looks like this. I don't know who's supposed to be running the show for the slides. We are. <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Just okay. give us one minute here. There you go. There it is. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. Um, first off, we're throwing around some phrases, and I want to make sure that we're using the same meanings for the same phrases. Uh, I've heard workforce, I've heard affordable, I've heard affordable by design, and I've heard missing middle. So it, it's my understanding that the C-shaped complex is to be workforce housing or missing middle housing? Yes, I mean, the, the reason that, okay. I, I don't like the term workforce because both of the communities are providing workforce housing. Okay. There will be people working in local jobs, living in the affordable as well, so that's is, why I use missing middle. Yes, and missing middle has a number of meanings as well. Is that 80 to 120 AMI? It's unrestricted. It's unrestricted, so it is not 80 to 120 or 80 to 150 or 80 to 180? Not from a restricted sense, but it's designed to serve folks within that range. But you're not restricting it? Correct. So that's basic market rate housing? Except that this is where the affordable by design comes in. So these units are smaller than what a, mar a, right. a luxury market rate apartment builder would be doing. Typically, uh, Okay, I, I hear you, but they are not restricted. That's correct. Uh, um, and that's, that's an exchange I, for what they're paying for the land. So. And my understanding is that the L-shaped building is the 30 to 60 AMI. That's correct. Okay, and the two different buildings will have two different builders. Is that correct or not? That has not been determined yet. I, um, they certainly could have the same. It will depend, I think, on the timing of when they're built. Okay, so I'm, maybe I'm confused. My understanding was that one group was doing one and Urban Mix or... Midpen Housing is the developer. Okay. And Urban Mix is the developer of the C-shaped building. Mid so Penn they have two different developers. Correct. But it could be that they choose the same. General Dinner, contractor. They may not choose the same bill. Correct. Could be either way. Correct. Okay. If I'm hearing you correctly, you are making a separate but equal argument. You are telling me that you can build these two buildings to equal quality separately. That's what I'm hearing. I should mention, just as an aside, that my sixth grade class was the first integrated class in my city. Um, so I experienced having uh, a city where on one side of the tracks there were one group of people and on another side of the tracks there was another group of people and at one point by mandate we were all bused to the school on one side of the tracks and everybody went to that school for a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how my school, my city achieved integration. Um, so I grew up in a segregated community. I grew up in a community with separated water fountains. Let me tell you that just because there are two separate water fountains, one at the front of the building and one at the back of the building, does not mean that children play together in the adjacent park. I've seen it. It doesn't happen that way. Um, 
I have a lot of concern about the wrong side of the street. When I look at how this is shaped, the parking is, is, is very clearly separated. The C-shaped parking uh, is, is within the arms of the C as well as some parking behind it. The L-shaped parking, most of that parking is to the outside. So these buildings actually back in a way to each other. So when you pull in with your family in the car and go in the building, there is not interaction at the doorways between the two sets of buildings, and there is a main street between them. I mean, it's not a big main street, but it's a substantial street between them. Um, it really concerns me, and I am having difficulty understanding why you aren't asking us for a variance on the distance between buildings at a lot line because that's the variance I'd have been happy to give you. If you, look, if you shaped the parcels so that, for example, the vertical parcel on the L were swapped with the vertical parcel on the C, I would be happy to grant you variances on the distances to the lot lines because you could draw those lots separately. So why have you come before me and not at least integrated chunks of the buildings, even though you, you can't integrate door by door. This is a couple of comments on that. First of all, we're not talking about any kind of racial segregation. It's income segregation <clears throat> right now. And as Jen mentioned, there's income opportunities on, on, on both buildings for people's incomes to grow. Um, I think this, this, the grid structure of this, uh, uh, this map is based on the city of Santa Rosa general plan requirements, the court requirements, the planning department and the engineering put down upon us. And so we built around those requirements. The map looked different uh, when it was being entitled under the county of Sonoma. And so we, we worked within the, the structure that was provided. So I heard $10 million of public funds in one piece of the conversation, and I heard 2.7 million also mentioned. How much in public funds is in this project? In, in 2011, this, the Development Commission purchased the seven acre parcel for $3.74 million when it was still the redevelopment agency. Mm -hmm. And there was a there were redevelopment funds in totaling 6.6 .6 million that were committed to the project. So now, as the housing successor agency, we are utilizing those funds to carry out pre-development and, and infrastructure construction. So that's roughly puts you at about 10 million dollars. Okay, thank you. And um, councilwoman, uh, when I when oh. I. Yes, might, might I address your point as well around the separate but equal? You can try. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So I've been involved in, in building affordable housing for my entire career, which is over 25 years now. We are deeply committed to the success of our residents, and we believe that what we're able to do is build beautiful communities that allow our residents to truly thrive. And there are many, many instances, in fact, you could look at any of the, the affordable housing communities that your city has sponsored, and it is a building in a neighborhood. That's how it gets done, typically. It's a building in a neighborhood. This is no different. This is a building in a neighborhood. It's not a segregated neighborhood. It's a, an affordable building that offers housing at a certain price point in an integrated neighborhood setting. I, I hear that we have had in the past to put one building in the middle of one neighborhood. We have an opportunity here to do better than we have done before. And I'm, I'm sorry that we aren't. Um, I have a question for staff related to this, if it's okay to ask that now. Okay, so if we, want to request a condition, for example, that the affordability be completed or at least substantially underway before certificates of occupancy are granted for the other 
unit. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Okay. Because my other fear is while this agent, this company may not have had the experience, my understanding, and correct me please, this is actually a question. I think we've had at least two other property developments where the affordability component was supposed to be built second, but didn't get completed the way we had anticipated that it would be completed. Like the company went out of business, so they just never did the affordability piece. I think we've had that happen on two. I'm, I'm remembering Christofferson as one and Tuxhorn as another. Does that sound about right to you? Have we had more than two? I think Courtside Village might be another one of those okay, as well. Okay, so there's a third. So we have this problem that I'm unwilling to make that mistake again. And, and I need assistance from staff on how to not make that mistake again. Because I'm very unwilling to do it a fourth time. It's like, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, through, fool me three times, fool me four times. I can't do that. Um, so help me figure that out. I'm open to suggestions. My first would be the conditional one. My second thought would be some kind of a bond. If there was a bond for the completion of the affordable sections, um, would it be large enough for us to do the completion of the buildings if they don't complete them? Uh, so I, I'm asking for staff to give us feedback on that. Surely, we'd be happy to do that. And uh, I will present some draft language for the council's consideration to that point. And then I'd also like to take a moment and just respond to the process, the review process, and how this project came to be and how city staff has reviewed this project working in conjunction with the applicant team. Uh, and so before I do that though, I will give some draft language just for the, the council's consideration. So something that we put together based on some of these um, sentiments is language that goes as follows. The developer shall be in compliance with the housing allocation plan, city code chapter 21-02, at the time of building permit issuance. For the purpose of this project, compliance shall mean compliance with Chapter 20-31 and either payment of in lieu fees for market rate units on Lot 2 or commencement of construction of affordable units on Lot 1. Can you repeat that so that I can hear it? The developer shall be in compliance with the housing allocation plan, City Code Chapter 21-02, at the time of building permit issuance. For the purpose of this project, compliance shall mean one, compliance with chapter 20-31, and two, either payment of in lieu fees for market rate units on lot two, or commencement of construction of affordable units on lot one. So well, it ties a fee to that construction activity. We have been discussing making modifications to that section, chapter. Will those changes occur in the near future? Are you bringing those before us soon? I, I don't know. Okay, so it may not be in time if they apply. I, 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 I think we'd have to look at the calendar and lay that, I'm, I'm not 100% okay. sure. So it would be the old ones and less likely the new ones. Yes, ma'am. If I may, I also wanted to um, give some explanation of um, that um, proposal, and that is um, that the C building, the market rate building, would be a permitted use and allowable as it is. With It does not require any density bonus. So what um, the concern was, was that if the market rate housing could go ahead and be built and never realize the affordable um, construction, they would still have to comply with the housing action plan, which would be, they could fee out at that point. So what that condition would allow is, in the event that the C building goes forward first and reaches, um, uh, reaches the uh, uh, final occupancy, at that point, if the affordable units were not under construction, they would have to pay the affordable housing fees instead. So it does not guarantee that the affordable housing units are built, 
but it, it addresses um, the affordable housing contribution for those market rate units. If we accept in lieu fees, at, at, I don't, I'm not aware of us having in lieu fees that pay to build affordable units, that they're really not substantial enough at this point to do that. Um, um, if, I, if I may. Where is that coming from? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Aldo Mercado. I'm here. I, I represent the CDC. And to, I think, the point that I, we appreciate, at least I know the CDC does in particular, with the concerns about having the market rate go prior to or having a community that's partially built. I think what, what we want to highlight that the CDC as the owner is in a very, very unique situation. They, as a successor agency to redevelopment, have acquired their interest in this property have spent close to $10 million in this property with strings attached on those monies. Those monies require that the CDC as the owner build affordable housing. That will then be implemented as it sells these lot, the lot out to the subsequent owner. So what I wanted to highlight was the concern about timing, though may be very relevant in most projects where you have private for-profit or non-profits working together, here because the CDC as the successor agency is taking it already bound by the health and safety code and the restrictions that it places as the owner, there in essence is already a covenant requiring that the affordable housing be built. So let me go back to my city attorney. I understand that the CDC, while they own the property, has obligations. When they sell the property, does the new property owner have those same obligations? And do we have any rights to tell them that they have to sell the property within any specific language or any specific covenants on their sale? I would have to say that I'm not um, an expert on the Community Development Commission and, and their particular requirements um, or indeed in the redevelopment agency um, as well. Um, that being said, I do understand that there are restrictions on how that money, how those monies can be used, how that translates to um, uh, uh, the property. I would not be able to tell you and um, the okay. County Council would be in a better position to address that. Okay. And I'm seeing some nodding heads up there. I'm just, from my point of view as the city, we don't have any control over what the county property development, what, what the county CDC does. The only control we have is over our permitting process. That, that's so correct. I would want some kind of condition on our side because we can't control what they do. And I appreciate that they may think they have the ability to require something, but when it comes to us, we can't enforce the county, if, if I've understood correctly. The county has to enforce the county. Would it be okay if I spoke to that? I'd, I'd rather hear from my city attorney unless she yields that, to you. That, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, on, the, on the, getting down to an issue that we're actually talking about, <laughs> uh, the other issue we're talking about is the circulation access. And that's why this slide is up. Um, what I see is one circulation access point. Uh, I'm look, there's little green lines. I'm not sure the public can see that, but uh, there's there's a little one little green line going from uh, west to east on the on the map. Um, based on on your reading of the easement. Is that a sufficient access to meet the criteria of the easement? And uh, I do have a copy of the easement now, Thank and you. the easement um, simply provides um, for a non-exclusive easement to use and to allow the use of vehicular parking lots and driveways which presently exist or will be developed in the future, uh, developed hereafter. Um, and so there is not a specific design that is required by the easement. So I guess I, I asked you to opine as to whether or not one access is sufficient to meet the criteria. It, it sounds to me as if the, the easement document says or at least anticipates there might be development on the properties. That is correct. So the existence of development is not a concern for me now, which right. was earlier. My, my concern now is whether or not one access point 
meets the criteria? That would be a very factual determination and would be, you know, you'd have to delve into kind of the history of the property, how the properties are being used now. Um, a, a, you know, one party might uh, assert against the other that there is an overburden of the easement um, by development on the site, but that would be a discussion between the two private between the two property owners, and it would not be for us um, or the city council to make that determination. Okay, so when I read the two copies, we have two resolutions on this item. When I read the two resolutions as they're written, they both specify denying the appeal, and then they each say something else. Um, is it possible to separate the denial of the appeal out from the other two pieces? In other words, can we deny the appeal but have a question about the tentative map as a council or the bonus and concessions as a council because they're intermingled in these documents? Yes, the um, whether it's in one resolution or multiple resolutions, but what is before you tonight is the project. Um, Obviously, it's it's before you because of the appeal, but under our city code, you have the discretion to look at the at the project, at the underlying project, and anything related to the appeal. Okay. And if how is it how is it that we would attach a condition as we're discussing? Would we attach it to both resolutions or to only one or? It depends on what the nature of the condition is. As presented um, as a suggestion from staff. If I may, um, the condition is uh, modifying an existing condition seven in exhibit A on the tentative map resolution. Uh, okay. It builds on a standard requirement to comply with our um, Okay, so housing. the first. The first resolution mentions the tentative map, the second does not. That's correct. So it'd be on the first resolution. I just wanted to understand what I might be doing in the future. Um, if we ask for the buildings, to the, the tentative map to come back divided differently, and I'm not sure that I have the numbers to do that, but if we wanted to move the map in such a way that we had a more integrated, although each individual building is segregated still, we understand that's a state, you know, federal problem associated with tax law. If we wanted to ask them to come back with that swap out, um, how, how would we do that? Is it possible to do that? How would we do that? Because the, um, the separation of the uh, market rate and the affordable units um, was part of the concession for the density bonus, um, you would have to make certain findings. Um, you'd have to determine that um, that concession of the separation of the units does not result in identifiable and actual cost reductions uh, relative to the affordable housing construction. There are other findings as well, um, but I think that would be the one that you would want to focus on uh, uh, if you were to, you would in effect be denying that con concession and then adding uh, conditions to the, uh, to the map. If we wanted to move forward, let me rephrase that. I'm assuming that if we made a request for a change to the concessions, that it would cause delays in the project coming back to us based on how long things take for us to do, because it takes us time, government moves slowly. Um, if we were to do those delays, would it cause them to miss the window for their application, for their grant application? Would that cause a, a window to be missed? Yes, it would. Okay, don't want them to miss the window. Okay, thank you very much. It's been very informative. I appreciate your help. 
So again, if we can just, if there's any questions for the applicant, Mr. Tillits and then Mr. Reismeyer. I just, just had a quick one and this was following up on a point that Council Member Combs brought up. Um, if my memory serves, we, do we collect 15,000 per market rate unit created in, in lieu fees? Do you know what the, the total is? The uh, in lieu fee for rental units is based on square footage and based on the map that they presented to the design review board, I calculated an in lieu fee for the entire, for the 100 units mm -hmm. at about approximately $85,000. 85000 okay. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I wanted to give you a chance to answer the question that it looked like you were gonna answer about the transferability. Uh, what was your answer on that? Well, that the, 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 again, as Aldo brought out, by means of health and safety code, we are required to deliver affordable housing. Uh, we, are, we have in place a development agreement that will be executed as soon as uh, CEQA is approved by this body. Um, that, that document will restrict mid-pen housing to building affordable housing. It will require them to do that. So that'll be a binding legal document between the Development Commission and mid-pen housing and that's how the Sonoma County Community Development Commission will ensure that our responsibility to build affordable housing is met by, by mid-pen housing. And in the event that those units are sold, would they still be affordable units? Yes. Great. They, yes. And then I thought I heard you say, and I just want to make sure and clarify that part of the separation between the very low income and the market rate was a federal requirement that allows you to bring in additional dollars if you do it like this. I'm just saying in order to access the amount of equity that's needed to build a project like this uh, and to get federal tax credits that that's, that's what meant, you know, that's what causes the design to be this way. Great, thank you. Do you have a question for the applicant? I, I'd like to follow up with that answer if I may. Um, so my understanding is that the federal credit is based on the um, the lot. Have I misunderstood that? Can you clarify? The, the federal tax credits are allocated based on the basis of the building. Right, so it is how the base of the building is. No, is the, the basis, basis. Meaning, meaning the cost to construct, essentially the cost to develop is what the tax credits are based upon. Um, okay. Yeah. Usually, um, I'm told, please correct me, that uh, it's the column of the building, that the re otherwise you could mix the doors. So why can't you mix the doors? It, it's not that we can't, it's that to do so would, would reduce the number of affordable homes. And that's, that's the issue. And the, the financing, it, it, the, what the city attorney just talked about in terms of reducing the cost, that finding that the Planning Commission made is the crux of this. Mm -hmm. That to, to design, the, design it differently such that the affordable buildings and, and market rate buildings are interspersed would increase the cost. It would mean that the projects could no longer proceed entirely independently, which was one of our goals, because we didn't want to be tied to the market rate developer schedule, nor they to us. We want to be able to proceed as quickly as we can. And, and it also complicates the, it also adds to the cost of the project just in terms of the complexity of having to put a condo map on the property as opposed to a typical subdivision map and then the way that it's financed. Um, and because we're bringing in tax credits that a private investor purchases, they're a part owner in the project for the first 15 years. And so that requires a level of complexity because of their role as an owner that makes it more difficult to, to build affordable housing projects in the way that you're suggesting. So I, I see a couple of ways. One of them was mixing doors. One of them was mixing floors, and one of them was making blocks of the building be, sep be integrated. Right. And what you're saying is all three of those are too expensive. Yes, in this case, your, your suggestion of taking one wing and, and putting it on the other building and vice versa would mean that the two 
projects could not proceed independently at that point. They would have to be constructed at the same time. They're designed to, to function like one building, it, or it would require a complete redesign of the project. But in any event, it would mean that the two, the, the market rate and the affordable component would have to proceed together, and we don't want to be slowed down by the market rate project. That's the fundamental. You know, as the mar as the master developer, our goal was how we can bring a, a market rate developer in in a way that doesn't impact our ability to deliver the affordable housing. And this was our solution to that. And also to maximize the number of homes. And that this is our solution to that as well. Okay. This is the first time I've heard that the affordable will come first. And it would have been very nice to have heard that much earlier in this process, just as an aside. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think before, I guess what I'm asking is before we start coming to conclusions and rewriting resolutions, this being a public hearing, it'd be nice to hear from the public uh, so I can better make some decisions myself. So I would ask you to open the public hearing. Any other questions? Great. Okay, we are moving to the public hearing, so I will open the public hearing. First up, uh, George Uberti, followed by Ann Hammond. Oh. All right, I want to be very clear about two things. Uh, the first, absolutely denied this appeal. Parking is not important. Easements can be rearranged. People need to live somewhere. The second thing I want to be absolutely clear about is that we are talking about a segregated building. All right, the line across which we segregated is significantly less important than the fact that we would be building a segregated community. All right, think about what it would be like to live here. You know which building the poor people building is. It's not confusing and the impact it's going to have on the people that are going to have to live in those spaces is absolutely, we know what segregation does to people and it's damage. All right, now secondly, now the, the third thing I want to be clear about is that in addition to that just being a fact, um, the, there are, we're being very uh, dishonest here about what we are actually being obligated to do uh, in terms of our uh, responsibilities towards building affordable units. There's absolutely nothing that says that there needs to be a separated building, all right? And in fact, um, if you look at the, uh, in the first resolution, uh, right here under provision C, it says the subdivision complies with the city of Santa Rosa housing allocation plan by providing more than 15% allocated affordable units, right? Now that's 15% total units. It says absolutely nothing about them being in a totally separated building, right? Um, similarly, if you look at government code section uh, 65915, Right? Um, in the California government code, uh, it specifies that 10% of the total units of a housing development, right, um, be for lower. So it seems to specify, at least by my reading, um, that a, any building has to have 10% total units, right? Which I, I think would be read as you have to not segregate buildings. They, they wrote this law specifically to avoid the things that Mrs. Combs talked about. Number one, that we, you know, say we're going to build a building that never actually gets built, which has happened in the history of Santa Rosa. And number two, that we don't build segregated communities. Now, what the people from Midpen have said is that it would be harder to do the right thing. It usually is. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It means we should do it. All right, now if it would slow things down, it probably would have been a lot faster by not designing a segregated living environment to begin with, right? Uh, we need to get off the ground doing the right thing here. Okay, so number one, absolutely deny this appeal, right? The fact that it's been around for 50 years is evidence we should change it, all right? We should build less segregated environments. Number two, let's 
build less segregated environments, build this the right way, you have the power to grant whatever easements and whatever uh, things you need to under this density bonus, and I encourage you to use that power in a positive way. Thank you. Ian Hammond, followed by Robert Nellison. Good evening, Mayor Swedhelm and the council members. I'm Ann Hammond, I'm the director of the Sonoma County Library. And as you know, we recently signed a lease for a temporary Roseland branch, um, but a permanent home for the Roseland Community Library is a very important goal for, uh, for this community. In the past, in the past year, we've had over 26,000 library users walk through the doors of the current Roseland Library, and we have offered, on average, 26 library programs per month, with many of those programs providing early literacy support, which is vitally needed in this community. Uh, we are excited to share the news that we will be increasing the number of open hours for the Roseland Library before the end of this year. The library has been closely following the Roseland Neighborhood Village Project. We are encouraged and excited about the vision for the project, especially the Civic Building. Uh, and we are pleased to see in your staff presentation a mention of a permanent library in Roseland. We know there are concerns about parking and other impacts, but we believe that the neighborhood and the proponents can work together and in good faith to make this a win-win for Roseland. We look forward to continued conversations with the city and the county in responding to the needs of the Roseland community for a permanent neighborhood library. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Robert Nelson, followed by John Paulson. It, excuse me. Um, the, the, uh, they, Mr. Nelson uh, is part of the um, appellant team and so did speak them. earlier. Um, I don't know if there's a time where there's a rebuttal, but uh, in, the, in the course of the public hearing, it would he's had this opportunity to okay. do the presentation. Sorry, Mr. Nelson, and that'd be the same for John Paulson. Okay, Peter Rumble, followed by Paul Carroll. No, there'll be opportunity for additional questions from council, but you've already been given an opportunity to speak, so thank you. Peter, Peter Rumble, please. Go ahead, Mr. Rumble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Peter Rumble from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. I'll start by professionally saying that the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber is uh, in strong endorsement in favor of this project moving forward. Uh, I'm not sure that there's much I can say from that professional perspective to, or that organizational perspective to, uh, to change minds if they may be wavering. Tonight, so I wanted to give a little bit of my own personal uh, story uh, on this. So I remember when the community came together when I was an analyst at the county administrator's office before we purchased uh, this property uh, and the community saying that this is the type of development they wanted. Uh, and then I remember as a, dep as a uh, director of health policy uh, when I was able to complete the portrait of Sonoma uh, data and reports saying that this is the type of community uh, development that should happen uh, in the community. I remember as a deputy county administrator uh, responsible for community engagement and community affairs uh, when the community was heartbroken as well as the county uh, that redevelopment was dissolved uh, and it jeopardized uh, the viability and future of this project. Uh, I remember uh, as uh, someone deeply concerned uh, with the state of housing uh, and the viability of uh, portions of our community that were left out of the city, uh, both uh, as a private citizen and then again as a deputy county administrator, uh, what would happen with this property. And now uh, with the chamber, I see uh, the community coming together to once again say that this is the project that it wants. Uh, and so I'm not sure, again, what I can say to, uh, again, maybe change minds that, that may be swaying. Uh, I will say that uh, based on uh, over a decade of the community saying that they want this development, I, uh, I worry that it's not Plessy that we're replicating uh, 
by this development, it might be Plessy that we're replicating by not allowing this development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Carroll, followed by Octavio Diaz. Paul Carroll, um, I started working in housing in 1985 for the San Mateo County Housing Authority. And then I spent 12, that was three years, 12 years with the uh, Sonoma County Community Development Commission, also working in housing. And then I went to work for a labor union, which allowed me to be a housing advocate for a period of time. If this project had come up back in say 2002 or 2003, every housing advocate would be saying, yes, let's do this. This is what we need. The fact that the affordable is 30 feet away from the market rate doesn't matter. It is not, in terms of inclusionary zoning, it's not even remotely close to segregation. To claim that is specious at best and derides your credibility. So I would suggest you don't do it. This area needs this really bad. And this can be a springboard for future development along Sebastopol Road and other areas of Roseland that are badly needed. So, if you wanna to wait to get things perfect, you're gonna wait a really long time. I currently work for Community Action Partnership and we have two homeless shelters that we run. We are in dire need of every unit that addresses 30% of median income. Every unit, because that will make the homeless problem um, less critical. So holding this up to try to get it perfect is gonna victimize a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Octavio, followed by Chris Grable. Hello, good evening all. Uh, Mayor, uh, City Council from Santa Rosa. My name is Octavio Diaz. I'm a uh, local entrepreneur in Sonoma County. Started with Agave and Hillsworth. It's a small restaurant. Um, our family uh, prides ourselves and working very hard in this community. And what I do see happening is what we call a broken window in a car in Brooklyn or Oakland. This is your broken uh, window car in Roseland. And by uh, making this happen, you will elevate the psychological way of thinking of those people that live within five, 10, ten mile radius right away. What that means is no garbage or less garbage, it would put pressure in other business owners to paint, renovate, otherwise this would not be happening. So please, I am for you making this happen with uh, the CDC working with Marco Suarez at the Economic Development Board to give some uh, credit to Efren Carrillo and Alan Herman. I'm very impressed with how professional has this been handled to make this happen. I am not doing this to make more money for my own pockets and go to the Bahamas and see the business from uh, my phone. I am doing it because I believe in education in this community. And as, as first generation Latino from Mexico in Sonoma County, you don't know why we have in Sonoma County. But if this continues to happen, you are putting the brakes on something magical for, for my family to continue to support education, which is what we need in this community, in this county. Mitote will be a, an example of educating not just the Latino community, but everybody in Roseland to come in and try something different, to learn about the different cultures from different states of Mexico, which is to enrich what's already there. 
but to clean it up a little bit more, to be a high standard place where people take pride in what's already there, but enhance it even more. So think about the car that's got the window broken nobody cares about. In two hours, that car would be vandalized and nobody cares about. Roseland has been left out for many, many years, or who knows, centuries. You have the power tonight to make that change for the better. I, I am very involved in Oakland. I have a small restaurant in Oakland, and I can tell you this, a lot of people that don't want to move forward with positive things, they have nothing to offer. They have nothing to offer. They, my, my job is to create jobs, pay taxes, and that's all that we're trying to do in Roseland. So please, make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Octavio. Uh, Chris Grayville followed by Efren Carrillo. Good evening. I'm gonna make a joke first and then I, I'm gonna go hard on this. I'm, I'm pretty fed up with, with the waiting and the perfection and what that means for the people who need housing and what it means historically in this town. I'm ready for that, the noise ordinance. If we could take some of that noise and put it in Roseland so that we can both have the hammer swinging there and the party to celebrate when it's finished. I live two blocks away. Show me the noise. We'll bring the noise. Come on. My dad started working on this the advisory capacity in the planning phase. This is 12 to 25 years. My dad died during the planning of this project. Let me just let me just let that sit with you, okay? He worked on all affordable, he worked on the ideas of inclusionary, all these things. If the financing mechanisms and the syndication and the regulatory framework was there to do inclusionary and to do it fast, it would it would have been done and you would see it all over this town. But then to say that, that an all affordable development shouldn't happen because it's segregationist, that's, that is ridiculous. And then we should, should we not have any all affordable developments across the town because that's, that's what you're saying. That's, that is what is available to us to build now. And the alternative is mostly poor people of color commuting because they can't afford to live here or living four families to an apartment because they can't live here commuting one to two hours, not seeing their kids, not being there to spend time with them for their entire working life, essentially. That is a huge deal, and it's been a problem. The best of intentions in this community have resulted in exclusionary outcomes, racist exclusionary outcomes. And I say that racist because equity is what needs to happen. It's not just another project. Roseland's is not just another area. This is an underserved area that has been historically and systematically put on the back burner. Equity means it's not just another project, it means it's a priority. And you make it a priority, and you show that the reason that we voted for you to build housing, to do the best for our community, that, you, that you're willing to do that, and we'll keep working on better and better things. But I'm sorry, it's the, the time to, to chop this up and whittle it away and take another 12 years. This is an intergenerational project. Is my daughter gonna be up here next? I'm not kidding, man. This is. This is really frustrating. And I spend most of my hours and most of my days, and she knows, she's like, Papa, is there another meeting? And I'm like, yep. And she's like, "Are we? is it for housing? I say, yep. So please, just take some action. We've been setting ourselves up as a city to be able to be in this position to start saying yes to really amazing things. Si se puede. Adelante, por favor. Thank you, Chris. Efren Carillo, followed by June Grable. You want to join me? Okay. Uh, Mayor Schwedhelm, uh, esteemed council members, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Efren Carrillo, uh, former Sonoma County Supervisor and also with uh, Burbank Housing. Um, let me read a quote here. The dream of turning a blighted shopping center in the heart of Roseland into a prized neighborhood center southwest of Santa Rosa is closer to reality than it has been in years. Martin Espinoza, May 11th, 2010. Albertsons departed the shopping center in 2003, 16 years ago. Residents called down to the county to do something which led to the Sebastopol Road Urban Vision Plan in 2005, which then led to a rezoning of mixed uses on the site. 
The silver lining of the departure of Alpha Beta, Lucky's, and Albertsons was the rise of Latino owned mercados, Lola's Market, Rancho Mendoza, La Guadalupana, Camacho Market. Having gone to Roseland Elementary School in the late 80s, I've seen the changes in Roseland and the opportunity that the council has before you is one to continue to feed into that dream that the Roseland community has had for decades. The county under now the now defunct redevelopment era initiated purpose, uh, purchase of the property to ignite the possibilities of realizing that dream, recognizing that under private ownership, it was not in their control to move that forward. That purchase alone turned a blighted, privately owned property with little change or desire for anything but into a public community asset. It's a public community asset. In Midpen Housing, you have a nonprofit affordable housing developer that is respected and reputable in every other city and county they have done work in. And I say this as a sometimes competing affordable housing sister agency where we do compete for projects and we compete for funds. And yet we recognize that it's important to have folks that do this work in our community to ensure that we can do it better. But MidPen does not build buildings. Like all nonprofit affordable housing developers, we re-envision communities. We provide opportunities for working class people to live in our communities. About the housing mix, let's just assume that you were looking solely at a for-profit development and what type of requirements would be instituted by the zoning and the rules and the regulations before you. In that construct, if this were a private development, you would be considering a project that is proposing 42% fully affordable inclusionary homes or rentals as part of that project. 42% if you look at the construct of what's being presented for you. This will be a fully integrated community that is responding to the community's interest and desires for decades. Rather than considering additional conditions for a nonprofit housing partner and a county sister agency in an attempt to make things better, Let's not burden an already complicated vision and process and deny the appeal and support the Planning Commission's decision. And if anything, let's talk about what ourselves, what we can do and what else the city can do to support this dream. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Efren. June Graybill, followed by Ben Terry. Is there something to say? Say, say, yes, to say yes to housing. No. Is she good there? Thank you. Ben Terry. Oops, hold on just a second. There you go. My name is Ben Terry, president of the NACP in Sonoma County. I was listening to those two ladies and their perspective on this is the same as mine and the NACP. You say there's separate. No, this is one community. How can it be one community when you got two different houses? It don't work. I came out here, I've been out here ever since I was 18 years old. I lived in a segregated housing. Sooner or later, 10 years from now, those low-income houses on be worth 10,000 and the other one on be worth 30,000. You can't do that. And uh, a lot of this money is coming from, I think, federal government. You, we oppose that money going into housing that you guys don't make a lot of money on by separating the low income from the uh, regular house, and we oppose that. So those two ladies, they know what they're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cherry. Uh, Thomas Ellis?
Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And, the, and this project has, it, I think it really excites a lot of people. Um, it uh, was part of the process down there to look at that square and, and what it would be. It's, it's, it's really amazing, it's fantastic. There's a lot of really great things about it. Um, I, I would say that there's probably about three parking spaces on there that if you, if you do without those, you might be able to get a compromise with the neighbor and allow the access of the trucks to come in from behind the, from behind the market to come around and come out and uh, you know, irrespective of the mutuality of the part of the other parking, um, I, I think you're going to run into a bit of a problem if you try to go ahead and and block that access. That's my experience. Uh, so I would just say, do away with two or three three of those parking spaces right here, right now, and save yourself a lot of heartache. Make a compromise. Find a way there. I, I can't really say anything about about the, or the prefer not to say anything about the content of the housing or the mix, um, uh, but that I think it's apartments and it's not, as I understand it, it it's not individual ownerships, so people are not gonna actually accrue uh, values that are different. One, one being different from the other, one being, you know, a $10,000 house and a $30,000 house that are next to each other, and, and one's accruing an asset, and, and they're markedly different. That, if they're apartments, that's not gonna be the case. So they're not gonna have that. Uh, and, so, and so there's not a distinction there. So I'm, unfortunately, I mean, from, from that argument standpoint. But, but as far as going forward, I think, I think it's imperative that you attempt to at least address that one question, which I think is gonna cause a stalemate. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Those are all the cards we have. You don't have to fill out a card if you'd like to make comments on this item. Is there anyone else in the audience? Marcos. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor Shredhelm and Council and everybody here present. Marco Suarez, I am. I work for the County Economic Development Board, and on behalf of the county, I do work with the businesses there in Rosen and also the community. And we've been working on this project, if actually I, even before I was there, and but late, lately in the last four years, in terms of the businesses, the community, and um, on Friday there was an event at Los Cien Latino Leaders, and Noemi Palomino, who's a uh, mom, and she's an advocate in Rosen. She actually stood up and and said that, you know, and expressed what the community is feeling for the many years that they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And uh, so I hope that today, the only thing that <clears throat> that I can say in, on behalf of, of the people in Rosen is that you deny the appeal, allow this project to move forward, and let's you know, bring something to the community that it's gonna be great. I mean, there's people that are involved that are gonna incorporate community, local community there in Roseland. So uh, you heard Octavio, you heard Mr. Carrillo. I mean, everybody's, we're all in. I mean, we're working with it, we're boots on the ground. I mean, Chris Grable, where are you? Right here, you know, great people. So, I mean, we're, we're not gonna let the, this one slip away. I mean, we're gonna, we want, we're gonna be there, mid pen everybody there, they're committed. CDC, Ben Wickham, I mean, we're, we're right there. So uh, thank you for all the questions. I know that, you know, there's, there's been bad situations in the past and so, but we, we're really uh, hopeful and we're, we're positive on this one. So thank you again. And I was here with Peter Rumble and everybody working together. So let's, let's make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to council. Are there any questions for the appellant or the Mr. applicant? Mr. Mayor, Go ahead, uh, Mr. given Rose. some of the testimony that we've heard this evening, staff is requesting a 10 minute recess uh, so we can discuss some of this. Okay, that sounds great. We'll take a 10 minute recess.
Okay, we'll reconvene our meeting. Mr. Rose, uh, would you like give, to provide some information to council? Yeah, surely, thank you. So some of the testimony that was given uh, got staff's attention, uh, specifically the sequencing of the construction and when the affordable units could or could not be built. So that prompted the recess. We had a chance to discuss it internally as well as with the applicant team. Uh, the applicant team would like to clarify some of those statements and also offer some additional information that uh, we're hopeful is helpful for the discussion and the council's consideration. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Ben. There we go. So I just want to um, kind of walk the council through how the project will go forward and that, that will probably help clarify some things. The Development Commission, the first thing that we are going to do, that we're required to do, we need to build, we say build the infrastructure. That means we have to build all the streets, utilities, and that includes building out all of the lots. So right now we don't have enough money to do that because the infrastructure costs are quite high. So we build out the lots and the $2 million that comes from selling the market rate lot comes back into the deal and, and makes that budget whole. So that's why that's so crucial. And th that, the money from the, the parcel that we are calling market rate is going to go to subsidize the, the infrastructure construction on the entire project. So that's a crucial piece. And then I'll let, um, I'll let Keith from Urban Mix talk a little bit about why we can't link the market rate and the affordable parcel together, why that's going to be a showstopper. Uh, good evening, Keith McCoy with Urban Mixed Development. And as Ben said, um, this is a, a fairly unique project in that the market rate uh, project will help fund some of the infrastructure uh, at the, to the tune of about $2 million. We can't actually purchase the site. We don't have a fee interest in this project yet until the actual the parcel is created and there's infrastructure there. There'll be an appraisal done. And at that point, uh, and actually when we're uh, ready to pull a building permit, uh, will actually take ownership. But if you condition this project and tying it to the affordable, it will definitely hamstring our ability to get financing. Is there any question about that? Well, is there any additional information that you'd like to provide, or Mr. Rose, is there any additional information? Because the next step in the process would be see if council, after hearing from the public, hearing from the appellant, the applicant, staff, any final questions before we go to motion? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the item that got our attention was that uh, there was a statement that the affordable housing could be built before the market rate housing, and that's the clarification that we were seeking, and if the applicant wishes, they may want to clarify that further right now. Yes, I can clarify that. This is Jan Lindenthal again with Midpen Housing. What, what um, we are prepared to move forward as quickly as possible. That means our goal has been to not link the affordable and the market rate projects so that both could proceed as quickly as possible. That manifested itself in terms of how we designed it so they could be constructed separately and also in terms of the financing. We're prepared to submit our application to the state in August for funding that will help make up the financing gap and prepare us to, to um, secure our tax credits. If all that comes to, to pass, we'll be ready to start construction as soon as the CDC's finish the infrastructure. That may very well be ahead of Keith's schedule. Maybe not, maybe it will be, but my point is that we're not dependent on their, on their development happening. And so we can proceed on our own schedule and that's what we've designed and then our financing plan has been designed to facilitate. But, but just to add on, I think it, I just want to make it clear, we can't have a cross uh, condition that conditions the affordable housing to go first or second. It just doesn't, it doesn't work in the way we finance, which is just basically private financing through a bank. So that would be very difficult to do. Okay. So then let me bring this back to council. Do you have questions of the applicant, the appellant or staff? Ms. Combs? I believe that the gentleman who was concerned about the um, easement issue had wanted to make a quick statement of rebuttal and I wanted to give him that opportunity if that's all right. It, very briefly, please. Thank you. I would like to address what I personally observed since 1984, which is more than long enough as any 
one who knows anything about easements will attest to. Um, and then John, who was with his dad from the age of five, can talk about back to 1960. If you take the northern edge of the building that you see there on the map, the Paulson building, the white building, take the northern edge of that, there's a driveway that's been there, I know, since 1984, and it takes up the U or center section of the building to connect to West Avenue. That is the driveway that was in existence at least since 1984. And that is what is going to continue under the prescriptive easement terms. John can talk to you about what was in effect when the easement was signed. Thank okay, you. I, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, if you have questions, so uh, are there? That was, I just wanted him to say what. Okay, does council have any additional questions for anyone on this item? So I, I have a question for staff. We're now being told that we can't put a cross condition on, for example, that we couldn't condition the affordability based on the um, we can't condition the occupancy of one building with the affordability of the other based on uh, the difficulty of the applicant for getting um, financing. Is that, is that as, have I understood that that's what you're saying? I just like to be clear that I got it. Can we? The, they have now offered testimony that because of, for financing reasons, um, they are, <coughs> excuse me, they are uh, wa still wanting the concession of delinking those two components. Um, and they have offered testimony that the reason for that is, is that those two components are going to be quite independent, independent sources of financing, um, uh, and the um, urban mix has indicated that any linkage between the two would make uh, that financing uh, difficult. Would that include a bond, requiring a bond to make sure that the affordable is built? Was that, is that linking the projects or who would, who would be responsible for such a bond? Um, that's an, an open question as to who would be uh, posting the bond and what the nature of that bond would be. Uh, is, uh, my understanding is that some projects go forward. It's not unusual for a project to go forward with a bond. I'm just trying to understand the How do we do that? Well, we can describe to you a bonding process. It happens typically in a mapping exercise, Gabe can describe that, but ultimately that would have to be presented to this development team to see if they are willing to do that, capable of doing that. So if you'd like, we can give you a summary of how a bonding could work. Can you be brief? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so bonds are fairly typical in residential subdivisions and they're used as a measure to sh ensure that the public infrastructure is completed. Uh, so oftentimes we will allow the development of the residential units prior to the improvements being completed um, and the bond is essentially a performance bond that ensures those get done. Um, in those situations there is one developer, they're not linked into another developer so they can control the whole process. Um, the bond is required pr uh, uh, according to the Subdivision Map Act when they elect to do the building first. So that's really the most typical situation where we see a bond. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. Tibbetts, this is your item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And if it's all right, I'd like to provide some comments before I make the, the motions. You know, I, I think that what we have here is a project that has a lot of good uh, baked into it. We've got 52 low-income units, 23 very low-income units. Uh, these are a lot of the folks that we discuss uh, on a regular basis here in this chamber. We have the opportunity for the Boys and Girls Club to have a home, the library, a priority, also a priority of this council in addition to affordable housing. Uh, and the Mercado and the Square, and, and recalling back to my time working in Roseland as an intern with the Economic Development Board is, that was a very, that was the number one priority for those residents, if I recall correctly, was that Mercado and that square. And this helps bring that to fruition. You know, perfection, 
cannot impede the good in this instance and in seven years of public input. But with that said, the robust discussion tonight should not go unnoticed and the debate should not stop here. I think that mixed income housing is absolutely the gold standard of affordable housing. And as we talk about that more uh, in this chamber, as more affordable housing projects as components of market rate come forward, this body really needs to have policies or at the very least an understanding of how that works vis-a-vis -vis the financing, vis-a-vis -vis the mapping process and getting entitlements. So what you're gonna, you're gonna see from me tonight is to enthusiastically move this forward, but next week I am gonna be enthusiastically making um, a motion to uh, have that conversation because we must. So with that, I move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa uh, denying an appeal and making findings and determinations and approving the Roseland Village tentative map for the two existing parcels located at 665 and 883 Sebastopol Road, assessor's parcel numbers 125-111-037 and 125-101-031 file numbers PRJ17-075, MAJ17-006, and waive further reading of the text. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor, and be, I will be very, very brief. I am in support of the Planning Commission's decision. I appreciate staff's involvement. This has been a, a, a long and lengthy discussion. This is what we have been waiting for, in my opinion. I, think, I believe that a perfect project is an oxymoron. Um, I wanna move forward. Roseland deserves it, Santa Rosa deserves it. Um, the, 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 the broken window, um, let's put a, a shiny new car in the middle of Rose and, and get, go forward and give, give everyone in this community something they can be proud of, and I think that's, this, what, this, that's what this project will do. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez. Thank you. Uh, personally, this is a little bit of a frustrating process for me tonight. I think it exemplifies what we've put Rosen through in the past, is delays, 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 and frustration, uh, and that doesn't bode well with me. Uh, I think at the end, we need to listen to what the uh, residents of Rosen want. They put up a lot of uh, time and energy and input into the process. I know there's a lot of processes and opportunities for them to do that, and I, I cannot put myself in a position to start uh, meddling in some of those issues. And this is very specific to Roseland, only because of the historical issues that have gone there in the past. Uh, I, I don't live there. I visit there often. I eat there. I eat at private homes there. It's a great place to visit. Uh, and I look forward to doing more and more of that as, as the, the changes come. They are a part of our community, but again, the delays that we put this community through are, are, are unacceptable to me. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to move this forward by, by denying this appeal. Thank you. Ms. Combs, you have comments? Okay, you'll be coming next then. Ms. Fleming? I want to thank the, the staff and my council for a robust uh, conversation and MidPen and Urban Mix for sticking it out through this process. I want to be very clear that I, I will be supporting this project and that any hesitancy you hear from me is, is not me saying no to affordable housing. It's me saying yes to to a robust conversation that we have to have about the realities that we know when we do do segregation, and, and it is separate, and we are saying it's separate, and we are saying it's equal, and we know that those things aren't true. I do think that the, the tenor of the moment is that we need housing more than we need a perfect project. I will share that three years ago, two or three years ago, when I sat on the Santa Rosa Community Advisory Board, Urban Mix and MidPen came before me and told me that this was not my, that when I raised these concerns about the poor door housing, they really didn't want to have this conversation. There was an opportunity for you guys to have taken that into consideration, and while it might have cut down on a few of the affordable units, we could have had a better project, and you cannot claim that you did not know that this was an opportunity or a concern. And so I ask you to please be more mindful when you go around listening to community groups. Are you listening or are you just sharing it and checking it off of a box? Because I'm very frustrated that I said this three years ago and here we are today. So the community wants housing, fine, we'll go forward with it. 
Will we get affordable housing? Is that better than no housing? Absolutely. But the red herring was that it's not, that it's no housing. It wasn't no housing. It was a mix of housing. And would there be fewer affordable units? Indeed. But the outcomes for those families could have been far better than the detriment that we may see by separating out the families. So with that, those are my comments. And I hope that, you know, that we don't look at this moment the way that I look at the people who redlined the neighborhood that I grew up in. Because people don't typically get judged by the moment that they're in, and they get judged by future generations. And I hope that, that this gets looked at um, kindly and that this is a great opportunity for, for Roseland. Ms. Combs. Thank you. I've been excited and enthusiastic about the Roseland Village project for a very long time. Um, particularly excited and interested in the Zocalo, in the uh, vibrancy, in the idea of the full mixed use housing. Um, I have not been looking for perfect. I have repeatedly mentioned to the uh, mid-pen and, and multiple meetings that I had concerns regarding economic integration. This should not be a surprise to anyone. I recall at my last meeting with them saying, don't be surprised that I'm going to talk to you about concerns about economic integration. I'm really sorry we haven't found a solution for this for our first Roseland project. Mr. Grable's father once asked me to deny an affordable project that came before us because it was not fully integrated for families. I have had many folks comment to me concern about the kinds of separation that comes forward. For example, when we do project-based HUD voucher use because the concept was integration. One of the things that I'm hoping will happen when uh, Mr. Tibbetts brings the discussion forward next week uh, is that we will also ask our uh, colleagues in the Senate and the State House, the federal government, that we ask them clearly and concretely to look at how we can revise this tax credit so that we don't end up having to make decisions like this. Functionally, we are creating se separation by law. Um, we've spent a couple of hours tonight talking about this. That's really a drop in the bucket, and I'm somewhat unhappy to have been told that I'm significantly delaying a project by having a conversation about equity and fairness in construction practices at the one dais I can have that conversation at. Uh, it's been a couple of hours of delay. It's not a permanent project delay. I think we need to speak up for better housing, for better mixed housing. I think we can do that. I'm hoping that the result of this conversation is that the next project that comes forward, they've heard us tonight. Um, on that basis, I will approve, I will vote to approve this project, but I'm approving it with reservations. I think we need the housing. I know we need the housing, but I think the future is gonna tell us an awful lot about what happens between the L community and the C community. Uh, I think some of us have lived through that in other locations. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm gonna see it again here. Um, it's my understanding that we are put in a very difficult condition, uh, situation with regard to conditions. Uh, I sure hope that I don't discover that we have the fourth situation where we get only the market housing and that we don't get the affordability. I'm trusting that the county will follow up with their obligations. Thank you. Mr. Tibbs, do you have any final comments? No, I don't. Okay, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think part of the reason that this conversation has been as robust as it is, is that this is not just a project site. This is really the heart of a neighborhood. It is an area that's represented neglect for a long time in an area of our community. It's a part of our community that's under parked. It's getting a park. It's a part of our community that has not had the same level of economic development. This is going to drive business into the area. 
And I think the irony of this conversation about talking about economic integration on this project is that we have none in Santa Rosa to begin with. There are far too many people who are looking at the city wondering whether or not they can afford to live here. I I'm one of them. I live paycheck to paycheck in this city too, having to rent a an apartment. And to say that this project is going to, uh, there's more people are going to be able to live in our community. They're not going to have to travel as far to work. They're going to be able to spend more time with their family, like was said. And I understand that it isn't uh, how everybody pictured it, but I think we as seven members of the council who don't live in that neighborhood do a disservice to Roseland when we say that this isn't a perfect project and we're holding our nose and we're voting for it. No, congratulations to the neighbors who came forward, told us what they wanted and delivered a project based on the core values that they have based on what they wanna see with a park and with a community center and with housing. Yes, not as integrated as we would all like, but still congratulations to Roseland. This is gonna be one heck of a project and I hope it really is the turning point of feeling integrated into our community. Thank you, and I'm not gonna repeat many of the similar feelings I have as my colleagues, but one of the things for me, um, it's just the relationships we have in this community, whether it be my relationship with the chamber, or Ms. Grable, Mr. Carrillo, uh, Marco's talking to the downtown business owners, and hearing the business owners, and it's that consistent message that this is what we want. And it's, um, I, I, I'm excited to see what the possibility is because as what you were saying, Mr. Vice Mayor, I think this is a first step and we're gonna show that, yes, is it perfect? Absolutely not. But we're gonna make it the best possible project that we can, so I'll be enthusiastically supporting that. So with that, your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. We have one more, Mr. Mayor. And our second yep. it's resolution to introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa denying an appeal and making findings and determinations and approving a density bonus for Roseland Village mixed use located at 665 and 883 Sebastopol Road. Assessor's parcel numbers 125-111-037 and 125-101-031 file numbers PRJ17-075 DB19-001 and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional comments? Seeing none, your votes. And that also passes unanimously. Thank you. Mr. McGlynn, item 16.2. Item 16.2, public hearing, Guerneville Road Homes, planning project 1665, Guerneville Road, PRJ18, Dash zero eight nine, Kristen A. Tumains presenting. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. This is Guerneville Road Homes rezoning. The request is to subdivide one acre into 12 residential lots in uh, to be able to construct 12 attached single family homes. Uh, they will include three accessory dwelling units. Uh, the required actions were the rezoning, which went before planning commission with a recommend, recommendation for approval, um, a conditional use permit, which the planning commission approved, and the tentative map, which the planning commission also approved. This is the project location. It's on the north side of Guerneville Road between Marlowe and Ridley Avenue. It's currently developed with a single family home. Here's the project history. The most recent events, May 9th, um, 2019 Planning Commission recommended approval of the rezoning. They approved a conditional use permit for the small lot subdivision and they approved a tentative map. This item is also tentatively scheduled for final design review for the DRB um, July 18th. This is the general plan and zoning for the parcel. It's currently in medium density residential and it's zoned RR20. Uh, the project is consistent, the proposed uh, zoning is consistent with the general plan designation of medium density residential in that the designation allows a residential density at eight to 18 dwelling units per acre. Um, the project is proposing a single family attached unit type at 12 units per acre. This is the proposed tentative, uh, the approved tentative map, uh, the map approved by Planning Commission. 
Here is the site plan showing how the units will um, are proposed to be developed. It includes um, three accessory dwelling units, two at the corner and one in the top center. These are the proposed elevations. The, the one at the top shows the ADU um, to the side of the building. Uh, the garages are inset, sl inset slightly and they have um, front porches. Here are the rear elevations showing the um, private patio areas for the units and the fence. As far as pub public comments, staff received an inquiry from two neighboring property owners. One neighbor to the east cited concerns with noise from the proposed project, the status of sidewalks on the subject property, and concerns regarding potential overflow parking onto the Redwood Forest Friends Meeting House property. The applicant is currently in talks with a um, suitable fencing solution between the two properties. And as far as the project being, um, having an overflow parking issue, um, the, the, uh, the project is sufficiently parked for their use. A single family resident to the west emailed staff with questions regarding any proposed fencing. Um, as stated, the project will have a fence separating private rear yards from neighboring property owners. As far as CEQA, the project qualifies for a class 32 exemption per section 15332 infill development projects. And the project also qualifies for a CEQA exemption pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15183I for which no additional environment or environmental review is required when rezoning for general plan consistency. With that, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that the City Council introduce an ordinance to rezone a one acre property located at 1665 Guerneville Road from RR20 Rural Residential Zoning District to the R318 Multifamily Residential Zoning District to facilitate the development of 12 attached single family dwellings and three accessory dwelling units. The applicant's representative and engineer are here to answer any questions and staff's available for any questions you might have. Great, thanks, bring it back to council. Any questions for staff? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, do we have any cards on this one yet? You don't have to fill out a card. If you would like to make comment, please go up to one of the podiums. Okay. It's off easy. I just, I support it. You know, I, we clearly need more housing. Um, this is an opportunity to do that. Rezone, please. Thank you. Anyone else like to make comment? Close the public hearing. Mr. Olivares, this is your item. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce uh, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code reclassification of property located at 1665 Guerneville Road, APN 036-101-010 from the RR20 Rural Residential Zoning District to the R-3-18 Multifamily Residential Zoning District, file number PRJ18-089, and wait for the reading of the text. Second. Motion and second, any additional comments? Seeing any votes, please. <laughs> and that passes unanimously by six votes with Vice Mayor Rogers having left the meeting. All right, thank you. Item 17, we have no written communications. Any additional cards for public comment? Seeing none, meeting adjourned.